It is 6 p.m. on December 12, 2023, and I want to welcome everyone to their city hall. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Alter. Here. Burgess. Here. Dunn. Oh, wrong list. <laughs> <laughs> right. Next time. Okay, Alter. Burgess. Harmson. Here. Saleh. Here. Taylor. Here. Teague. Here. Thomas. Here. All right. Well, before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that we have two counselors. Uh, today is their last uh, meeting with us, um, Counselor Pauline Taylor and Counselor John Thomas. And on behalf of the City of Iowa City, we want to say thank you for your service. Um, eight wonderful years of uh, however you describe it, we'll listen to. Uh, but. We have some parting gifts for you both, and so wanted to just present this to you, thank you. and say thank you very much on behalf of the city of Iowa City. Oh, oh. yes. And if you stick around, we'll uh, ask you all to give some words at the end of the meeting today. All right, when we give our updates. All right, we're going to move on to item number. Um, Can we get the TV outside? Raise the volume is like nothing, and we're packed in here. Thank you. Yes, we will work on that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. I want to make sure we can do what we can there. Um, we're going to move on to items number. Um, our, I'm going to get a motion for consent agenda items, items two through six, with the exception of 5G. We'll uh, do a separate consideration for 5G. Can I get a motion, please? So move, second, alter. Move by Salee, seconded by Alter. Anyone from the public like to address a topic that is on our consent agenda? If you are online, please uh, raise your hand. If you are in person, do the same thing. Seeing no one, online or in person, council discussion. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Saleh? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. We're on to, we're gonna allow Councilor Burgess to uh, excuse and recruit herself from this item. Can I get a motion to approve item 5G, please? So move, moved, Thomas. Second, alter. Uh, anyone from the public like to address this topic? If you're in person, please raise your hand. If online, do the same thing with your virtual hand. See no one in person or online. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Harmson? Yes. Sella? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. <clears throat> this is an opportunity. For, we're going to move on to item number seven, which is community comment. This is an opportunity for individuals that want to speak on a on an item that is not on our agenda. Um, I do see lots of people here today. Um, so I wanted to uh, take a show of hands of everyone that wants to speak on an item that is not on our agenda. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to ask Mayor Pro Tem, help me to count the hands. <laughs> We've got one outside, too. One, two, three, four. I've got about 16 six, or 17, seven, Mayor. Eight. 9, 10, 11, okay. 12, 13, 14, We're seeing 14, about 16, 19, 16, 16. I, I got 19. Well, I have a count of 19 individuals. Um, because we really do want to hear everyone um, that wants to speak. I'm going to allow um, three minutes for starting. And... I'm going to ask if you're hearing that it's the same message um, that 
you may feel like you know that point has been made uh, just allow for newer information because we do want to hear everyone so there is a sign in uh, sheet at the podium there is also one in the back where there are some stickers that you can pre-sign up. So those that are wanting to speak, I'll ask that you go and um, kind of join a line and also bring up those speakers, uh, those stickers. Um, and we'll just ask people to come, give your name and the city you're from. And if we do go um, a little long, I'm going to reduce the minutes. Um, depending on how many people are available. So it could be two or one minute as um, I wouldn't want to do that, so. Welcome, start? yes, please state your name and city you're from. Hello, hi, um, my name is Dima Tota and I'm from Iowa City. Uh, I am a professor at University of, of Iowa and the views expressed here are my own. Um, so I am a um, Palestinian American. I was born and raised in Ramallah, Palestine. And the discomfort many of you may be feeling right now is the reason I brace myself before answering the question, where are you from? Palestine has become a taboo topic, a loaded word. But this word is my identity. It is who I am. And it has taken me 15 years of living in the US to start speaking publicly about my experiences for fear of retaliation, misrepresentation, and suppression here in the US, as well as safety concerns when visiting family back home. And I have many stories to say, but I'm just gonna give you a few. Um, so when I was 11, my home was occupied by over 60 Israeli soldiers for, for four days. Armed soldiers surrounded our house. They banged on the doors. They ordered my parents to go with them as they searched the house. And while my eight-year-old sister and I waited alone in the basement, we heard a barrage of shots. We had no idea where our parents were. The soldiers had shot out all the windows in the house to announce their presence in our suburban neighborhood. My parents are alive. My high school boyfriend arrived to school several times with bruises he got from Israeli soldiers while crossing checkpoints inside the West Bank just to get to school. Last year, my best friend's husband was pulled from his car and beaten up by Israeli soldiers. Three weeks ago, members of my family, including a 14-year-old, were held at gunpoint by a mob of settlers, escorted and assisted by an IDF Israeli Defense Forces soldier while driving through a Palestinian village 20 minutes from their home inside the West Bank. The last two months have seen a surge in wholesale killing of Palestinian civilians, set against a backdrop of long-standing and ongoing oppression by the Israeli government. And this government has received more US aid than any other country in the world, as this graphic shows. Let me open the graphic. And I'm worried they are going to receive more now. We have averaged $3.4 billion in aid to Israel every single year. And I'm living in a country that not only vilifies my identity, but it forces me to use my tax money that I've earned while serving this community to pay for the oppression of my own family. Since I moved to the US in 2008, this aid translates to hundreds of my personal tax dollars from me and from almost every single taxpayer in this room paid directly to the same government that has oppressed me when, I grow up, when I've grown up and continues to institutionalize this oppression. As I think of how we are complicit in abuse of power and humanitarian crisis currently happening in Palestine, know that if we do nothing, we are actively financing this violence every April when we do our taxes. It is time to end this now. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dan Phillips. I live on the east side of Iowa City. I'm a now retired medical doctor. In my 40 years of practice, I did family medicine, including obstetrics, and for the last 20 years, primarily emergency medicine, often in impoverished areas and with minimal, minimal access to technology. I've seen a lot of pain and death. I know the swell, the screams, the agony, and the despair of physical and emotional suffering. The ongoing massacre of over 18,000 Palestinians, most of whom are women and children, is not some video game with good guys and bad guys. This and the heartless, barbaric blockade of food, water, and medical supplies gives new meaning to the depth of human depravity, of which we are an active part. I can hear the cries 
I can smell the blood, the putrefaction, and the burned flesh. Israel has targeted and destroyed all the Gaza hospitals except for two in the south, killing over 300 healthcare workers. The first interventions in treating the injured are stabilization and pain relief. There is no pain medication, no IV therapy, not even water to wash wounds or to drink. I heard last week a doctor at the Al Shifa Hospital, now destroyed, its medical director was taken away in handcuffs, describing the death of a nine year old girl from sheer pain while having her leg amputated without medication, without pain medication or anesthesia, while lying on the floor of the remains of the hospital. Another was reporting on infants and children with extensive burns. Having worked in a large burn unit in St. Louis, I can't imagine the horror of enduring this without pain medication. Think of the everyday occurrences of kidney stones, gallbladder attacks, appendicitis, heart attacks, and bleeding ulcers. Think of cancer patients and diabetics now over two months without medication, if they're still alive. Israel directed 80% of Gazans to abandon everything and walk south. What happened to the disabled, the elderly? Are those too sick or too young to walk? Do we just leave them under the rubble of the houses? Now with Gaza's healthcare system destroyed and absent supplies, including antibiotics, do we just wring our hands while, while another expected 30,000 die of cholera and typhoid and pneumonia and wound infections? How many are to die of dehydration and starvation to satisfy Israel's desire for retribution and apparent genocide? It makes me feel complicit in this atrocity as I pay taxes. I call upon you to be human and condemn this atrocity and demand a ceasefire and peaceful negotiations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Please state the, your name and the city you live in now. Hello everyone, my name is Robbie Anala and I'm an Iowa City resident and student at the University of Iowa. I'm here to encourage the city council to adopt a resolution causing for the ceasefire and the ongoing genocide in Palestine. On March 25th, 2022, the Iowa City City Council unanimously passed a resolution in support of the people of Ukraine. This resolution condemned the Russian Federation's invasion of Ukraine citing its misinformation from propaganda and its attack on civilians, including a maternity hospital and theater full of hundreds of women and children. Unfortunately, this body has yet to pass a resolution that condemns the murder of Palestinians both before and after October 7th, 2023. This body picking and choosing which injustices to condemn is unacceptable and does not represent the ideals of my fellow Iowans. The resolution that we are asking for this evening is one that demands a humanitarian ceasefire in Palestine, one toe in the right direction. However, any such resolution should also unequivocally demand this country to stop funding the destruction of innocent Palestinians. By population, the Gaza Strip would be the fifth largest city in the United States, where more bombs were dropped in the span of a week than the span of a year in Afghanistan. Today, over 18,000 Palestinians are forever gone. School buildings, churches, homes, nurseries, daycares, gone. The Palestinian fight for justice is not synonymous with de denying the rights and security of Jewish people. It is a stand against Zionist policies, just as the ongoing black American fight for injustice is not synonymous with denying the rights and security of white people. It is a stand against white supremacy. As a collective, we should refuse to tell future generations that in the midst of ethnic cleansing, we were silent and stood by and did nothing. With factually informed views, audacious statements, and progressive resolutions being cast from today, our city council can be a shining example for cities around the country. U.S. support of Palestinian genocide, Congolese genocide, Sudanese genocide, any genocide, it needs to end now. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and city you live in. My name is 
Audrey Messenger. I'm an Iowa City resident and I am affiliated with Iowa City Jews in Solidarity with Palestine and Eastern Iowa Jewish Voice for Peace. As you have heard and will hear from other speakers, the humanitarian crisis and attacks on Gaza and arrests and killings of Palestinians in the West Bank are in violation of international human rights laws. These are laws which apply in any contact or any conflict, not just Israel and Palestine. Critiquing the Israeli government's disregard for human life and human rights right now and since 1948 is not inherently anti-Semitic. In fact, Jews and even Zionists have been criticizing human rights abuses in Israel for years. Entire Jewish organizations are dedicated to campaigning for Palestinian human rights, including the Zionist J Street, the anti-Zionist Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now, and Israeli group Beth Selim. Yet, our politicians in the House of Representatives recently passed House Resolution 894, which, and this is a quote, clearly and firmly states that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. I want to be clear that, first of all, what I'm focusing here, what I'm focusing on here is critique, which is not the same thing as anti-Zionism. Yet, in the public eye, it's a slippery slope. The government of Israel routinely attempts to quiet peace activists domestically and abroad through the conflation of criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism, and many of our politicians, as well as Christian and Jewish, Jewish Zionists are on board with this. In many communities in the United States, Zionism has become synonymous with American Jewish life, and those who criticize the Israeli government are more likely to be labeled as anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. This has real consequences in Iowa City. For those of us who frequently protest for a ceasefire, demonstrations are becoming more risky because people passing by are more likely to shout at us and accuse us of anti-Jewish sentiment. We should not be afraid to protest for basic human rights and freedoms for Palestinians. In addition, community members, particularly U Iowa students, who protest for a ceasefire are at risk of being doxxed and labeled publicly as anti-Semitic, which can have severe professional consequences for them. Furthermore, focusing on criticism of Israel as a source of anti-Semitism can detract from the acknowledgement of other sources of anti-Jewish hate. This is especially relevant right now in Iowa City, given the anti-Semitic comments made to the city council almost two months ago. I want to finish by referring to the Jewish concept of tikkun olam. This concept, which means repairing the world, represents a common hope for peace and humanity, which is something we should all be fighting for right now. Thank you. Thank you. Will you lower the mic? Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and say Hi. where you're from. My name is Tarwi Osman. I live in Iowa City, and I'm with Iowa City Action for Palestine. The scale of human suffering I've seen in these past few weeks have surpassed anything that I've ever known or could have imagined. Palestinian activists and reporters on the ground in Gaza have explicitly asked for these atrocities to be shared uncensored and in visceral detail because the magnitude of the carnage being inflicted upon them by Israel must be known. They said that they are recording and relating laying their darkest and final moments in hopes that they can move the world to stop the genocide. There are many videos that I've watched these past few weeks that I will never forget. A video where a father holds two bloodied bags of what he could find of his children screaming, my children are dead. Another video of a doctor performing an amputation on his child without anesthesia, who later died because of the level of pain and shock to his small body was unbearable. His father, the doctor, had to continue work while mourning his child's violent and painful death. Another video where small children organize a press conference in English to plead the world to stop the bombing, that they are just children and that they want to live. Another video of a bereaved Palestinian mother who just lost a child crying that her only hope is for the bombs to kill her before she has to witness another one of her children be martyred. It's important to acknowledge how the Palestinians are dying because they are not just dying, they are dying violent and brutal and hours if not days long deaths. They die by fire, they die suffocating for hours in the dark with broken and torn limbs under stories of concrete sitting atop them screaming to see if anyone else from their family is still alive. They scream for help from anyone above the rubble to find them and dig them out, while Palestinian men atop the rubble dig with their bare hands through, through thousands of pounds of concrete, trying their hardest to pull anyone they can out. There are no words sufficient enough to convey what is happening in Palestine. These are horrors that change people who just witness them irrevocably, let alone those who live through them. 
But I, what I will also never forget and what has inspired the world is the resilience, the enduring kindness, and the unshakable humanity of the Palestinian people. In the midst of death, the Palestinians teach life. Whilst the young girl is being carried on a stretcher out of the rubble, in shock she turns to one of the men and asks him if she is dead. And he replies, no, my dear, you are alive and you shine like the moon. In their darkest hour, we must not close our eyes or turn our backs on the Palestinians. Here in Iowa City, we must do our part to align ourselves with the international community in calling for an end to this genocide and an end to the senseless and indiscriminate violence. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Please state your name as city. Hi, my name's Nix, and I'm from Iowa City. I live in Iowa City, Iowa. Um, I'm here to share on my experience of being forced out of my employment in Iowa City due to advocating for a free Palestine. I was working for United Action for Youth, and in October began advocating that we speak to youth about Palestine in response to the escalation of the genocide in Gaza. I decided to offer zines to young people about Palestine. In response, management told me I was not allowed to disseminate information regarding Palestine to youth. I asked management to review three specific zines for approval, the history of Palestine, food oppression in Palestine, and indigenous solidarity. Management's <coughs> stance was firm. No materials about Palestine were to be shared. Following this directive, I kept the zines in my office away from the youth. To express my support for Arab and Palestinian youth, I put Palestine solidarity posters in my office window. Subsequently, I was called to a meeting with my supervisor and the executive director where I faced reprimands and was written up on two accounts, sharing information about Palestine and displaying the posters. When I asked the executive director if she had read the zines, she admitted to only skimming them and made it seem like her hurried response was due to my potential noncompliance. I want to clarify again that I removed the zines in question from the public areas and kept them in my office immediately after being told to do so. I was never instructed to take my posters down before being written up. Due to these write-ups, I issued my two weeks notice as I found it disgraceful to be limited in my advocacy. Surprisingly, my employment was terminated instantly upon giving notice, an action unheard of with other employees in my time at UAY. In my time working at UAY, I was never made aware of a written policy restricting unapproved materials from being shared with youth. To the contrary, staff regularly shared resources that were not subjected to a formal review process. During my employment at UAY, management clearly and consistently stated that we should advocate for trans rights, abortion rights, queer rights, women's rights, and racial justice. Yet the same advocacy was not extended to Palestine. I was told that advocating for a free Palestine was too political and complex. The selective restriction on discussing Palestinian issues and the punishment of employees for expressing solidarity with Palestine is a clear example of anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian prejudice in our community. I care deeply about advocating for social justice, and I was never silenced in my advocacy until I expressed solidarity with Palestinian human rights. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and city. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rima Afifi. I am a Palestinian American and a resident of Iowa City. And I'm also a public health academic by um, occupation. So I'd like to start off by confirming that international humanitarian law is explicit in its protection of healthcare infrastructure, including hospitals, medical staff, and ambulances, as well as the sick and wounded. Parties to a conflict must respect and preserve the function of healthcare establishments. With that in mind, I'd like to share reports about Israel's violation of international humanitarian law and its current war on Gaza with respect to healthcare infrastructure. A report from the United Nations Human, Ra Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner dated de uh, December 7th, so already outdated, notes, at least 364 attacks on healthcare services have been recorded in the occupied Palestinian territory since 7 October 2023. More than 50 health facilities and 190 ambulances have also been affected. Other healthcare workers have been injured, arrested, and detained, including, as you heard, the general director of Gaza's biggest hospital, Al Shifa, who was arrested on 23 November and his whereabouts are unknown. An Indonesian hospital has reportedly 
actually been bombed 35 times since 28 October. The health infrastructure in Gaza uh, has been completely obliterated, according to the special rapporteur. She also pointed to an immeasurable number of violations of the special protection afforded to civilians, children, and medical personnel under international humanitarian law, alongside widespread violations of international human rights law. And the rapporteur said, we bear witness to a shameful war on healthcare workers. This war is raging because of a lack of political leadership. End the war on Gaza and end it now. Also, since October 7th, 214 different hospitals have been bombed, 100 ambulances have been destroyed, and dozens of doctors have been arrested without charges. Their whereabouts remain unknown. On December 11th, just yesterday, Dr. Ben Thompson of the Union of Medical Care and Relief Organizations stated that 283 healthcare workers and 133 UN staff members have been killed in Gaza, the deadliest period in UN history. Of the 35 remaining hospitals in Gaza, he said, as of this morning, yesterday, 26 are non-functional, with nine remaining only partially functional. Key facilities like Gaza's only eye and mental health hospital, Wafa Rehabilitation Hospital, and Al Jirra Hospital have been targeted, some with white phosphorus, which international law dictates are never to be fired at or near civilian infrastructure. By mid-October, Al Ahli Ra Hospital had run out of blood, leading to post-surgery deaths. The entire Gaza city lacked functional hospitals, with only one remaining in the northern part of Gaza, leaving thousands without treatment access. A staggering 700 to 900 children in Gaza have undergone amputations, and a heart-wrenching acronym, WCNSF, Wounded Child, No Surviving Family, has emerged due to the high number of children injured without any family left. The targeting of medical facilities Thank has you. been a deliberate strategy of Thank the Israeli you. war on Gaza. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and city. Yes, hi. My name is Viana Kaddura. I am um, a human rights commissioner for the city of Iowa City. I'm a Palestinian, too. Um, I have lived there. I know what occupation means. I know what siege means. I know what starvation, what curfews, what uh, collateral damage means. We lived that. We have seen it. I'm not going to go and repeat what they have said and what they're going to say. As a child that's 10 years old, I have witnessed with my own eyes um, an army, an Israeli army, planting things within the dirt in my neighborhood. One day, we were just sitting there in our houses, just kids playing around. And all of a sudden, a big explosion happened. We heard the screams of parents, of neighbors. All of the water tanks exploded. People start shouting, you know, cars and calling for ambulances. As a child, I ran outside with my parents. We saw a bloody, shattered body. It was our neighbor. He was 13 years old. My uncle, he's the one who ran there and he held him in his, while he's wearing a white shirt. Until now, until this age, I remember the horrific scene. I seen it, his friend died. One left disabled. For many, many years, we can see the scars that this explosion did to the neighbors, to the neighborhood, and to the family, and to us as witnessed this. This is nothing comparable to what Gaza is going through. But you know what? When you live there and you sense that we are one body, we feel each other. And if anyone wants to doubt what occupations leaves a child with, what this horrific scenes and tragedies and atrocities leave you with, I'm willing to sit down and explain to you. So now, you know, what we're going to, what the Gaza's going to, you have to be honest with yourselves. What does it look like? They can cover your eyes so that you do not see thousands of dead Palestinian civilians, but have they covered your hearts? You are witnessing a historically brutal occupation. Gaza has become a graveyard for thousands of children. It's a living hell for everyone. Thousands of lives lost, countless families torn apart. This must end now. We demand an immediate ceasefire in Gaza to stop the violence and save innocent lives. Your voice can make a difference, and I'm sure that you can do it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to get a show of hands of how many individuals still want to speak. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. I'm going to have to uh, sh trim down the time to two minutes because I want to make sure that we hear from everyone. Welcome. Okay. Hello. 
My name is Casey Harwood. I'm an Iowa City resident and a uh, professor of mechanical engineering. Uh, you've heard it mentioned, the, uh, the lack of access to basic resources, and I'd like to delve into that just a bit more. International law has long established that water is a basic human right, uh, and right now it's critically, critically uh, compromised for Palestinians and has been for a long time because of Israeli restrictions. Starting in 1967, Israeli Military Order 158 made it illegal to perform nearly any activity involving water infrastructure within the West Bank. This included drilling new wells, repairing aging infrastructure, even so much as collecting rainwater. Without the issuance of an army permit, of which only 13 were issued in total in the 29 years following that order. The result has been a wide disparity in water access within the West Bank. In settlements, which are widely regarded as illegal under international law, settlers have unrestricted access, even while often only hundreds of feet away, Palestinians consume well below the WHO guidelines for sustainable water consumption. This is even more oppressive in Gaza, where, as we can see right now, Gazas in mid-November 2023 are consuming two to three liters per day, while the WHO has established a minimum short-term survival limit during emergencies of 15 to 20. That's less than 1% of what I, most of you, nearly everyone in this room uses every single day. And it's Palestinians are powerless to turn this around on their own. In October, Israel cut off the water supply into Gaza. And water within Gaza is 95% undrinkable because Israel installed a cordon of deep wells along the coastal aquifer that extracts most of the groundwater before it ever reaches the Gaza Strip. So I call upon the city council to consider requesting immediate and unconditional humanitarian aid be provided to Palestine so we can ameliorate these issues. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. Please state your name and city you're from. Hello, my name is Shauna Liu, and I'm a resident of Iowa City. I am a third year medical student at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine, and I'm here representing our White Coats for Black Lives chapter. I'd like to discuss our continued military and weaponry support for Israel, and first I bring you an example of what the US's military aid is doing there. An investigation by Amnesty International published last week has revealed that US made joint direct action that U.S. made joint direct attack, attack munitions were used in two deadly Israeli airstrikes on civilian homes in Gaza. The bombings killed 43 civilians, which included 19 children, 14 women, and 10 men. The strikes on October 10th and 22nd targeted the Al Najjar and Abu Mulek family homes, with no evidence of military objectives at either site. Both homes were in South Gaza, an area where displaced civilians were told to go by the Israeli military during the bombardment of the northern Gaza area. Distinct ammunition fragments found by Amnesty International contained serial numbers that linked the weapons to Boeing Corporation. The investigation incorporating survivor accounts, satellite imagery, and physical evidence suggests these were either direct attacks on civilians or indiscriminate strikes, both constituting war crimes. The investigation also found no evidence of military targets in or near the residences, raising serious concerns about the legality of these attacks under, under international law. The situation implicates the U.S. under its own Arms Export Control Act and international humanitarian laws, highlighting potential complicity and violations due to ongoing arms transfers to Israel. Israel has openly rejected the involvement of the international court, highlighting the troubling lack of accountability and recourse should we continue to supply arms and military aid. Your community calls on you to call for Congress to reject Biden's proposed $14.3 million military aid package to Israel, because to be clear, this is illegal under our very own arms Export Control Act that I just talked about. It is unconscionable to think that our money, my money, will provide weaponry to Israel and cause further Palestinian civilian suffering. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, my name is Clara Reinen, and I am a resident of Iowa City, as well as a graduate student studying library and information sciences and book arts. On November 20th, 2023, the Euromed Human Rights Monitor published a report asserting that cultural heritage institutions have been deliberately destroyed in Gaza by the Israeli military forces. Cultural heritage institutions are locations that, according to the Hague Convention, include but are not limited to museums, large libraries, and depositories of archives. The Hague Convention is clear in its language 
language. Purposeful destruction of these institutions is an irrefutable violation of international law. Without these important historical sites, the already sparsely available history of the Palestinian people is being further decimated. The sites destroyed include the historic Al-Omari Grand Mosque, three historic churches, five bookstores, the Gaza Center for Culture and Arts, the Hakawi Theater Association, the Al-Harara Cultural Museum, and the Rafa Museum. Uh, and as of December 3rd, over 100 heritage institutions have been destroyed. As a UNESCO city of literature, Iowa City has a responsibility to uphold the inherent value of all cultural heritage sites, domestically and internationally. Our own city of literature's mission statement is as follows, quote, to build and support diverse communities of writers and audiences through the transformative power of story. The website also states, quote, that our community has been, quote, uh, has long been quite simply a place for writers, a destination, a proving ground, and a nursery, end quote. The gentle, intimate language with which we cherish our history as a city that is and of itself a cultural heritage site are in stark contrast to the devastation and destruction that similar sites in Gaza face. Is this the tender attitude towards the humanities that inspired me to pursue a career as a librarian and information sciences professional? Where is that compassion and humanity now? In closing, I'd like to leave you with this quote from Jürgen Stock, the secretary of Interpol. Crimes against cultural heritage Thank do not you. just strike at objects. The destruction of heritage is linked to persecution of individuals and Thank you. communities on cultural grounds. Thank you. Yes. Welcome. Please state your name and city you're from. Uh, Rasmus Schluter, um, Iowa City. Um, my name is Rasmus. I'm baptized in the Greek Orthodox Church. My pronouns are they and them. I stand in solidarity and heartbreak with my Palestinian neighbors in Palestine, Iowa City, and across the world. Despite resounding national international demands for a ceasefire, the bombing continues. This is because the conflict is not solely between Israel and Palestine. Israel receives almost $4 billion of US aid every year and has received almost $300 billion since World War II adjusted for inflation. In 1986, then Senator Joe Biden defended this commitment, stating, were there not an Israel, the United States would have to invent an Israel to protect her interests in the region. I asked city council, whose interests are these? Are these our interests as residents of Iowa City. The occupation targets Palestinian intellectuals, doctors, journalists, writers, cultural institutions, as we just heard, civilians, mothers, children, fathers, every single person is a target. It is the enemy of memory, and it writes its occupation in craters and martyrs. But what is a ceasefire? It is in the word, a cease to the fire, an end to the striking of missiles, the dropping of bombs, assassination after assassination, the endless atrocities that committed against the Palestinian people. Those who oppose the ceasefire will concede, hope we will concede that the Israeli attacks are committed in our interests, that the bombs bought in our names rightfully deliver children to the grave. A grave so often whose burial is in the fallen rubble of homes. How can these be our interests? How can these be anyone's interests? USA to Israel will not give us health care, will not house our families, nor teach our children, nor grow our food. Instead, they employ tactics to silence protests and obscure the investments at play. The interests of occupation of Palestine are the interests of imperialists. The Palestinian people will continue to love, to struggle, and to remember. There is no violence which can silence the humanity of Palestine. So let us join the call for a ceasefire. Take our place alongside the global majority who know oppression is never in our interest. Palestine is in our hearts and our souls. Let it continue to be in our words and our deeds as well. For a ceasefire and for an end to this violent occupation. For a free Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to remind people again, there are stickers in the back if you wanted to pre-fill out a sticker. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Sarah Ann Colder. I work at Prairie Lights Bookstore. I grew up in Iowa City. On December 9th, this past Saturday, a peaceful and inconveniencing protest action was done at Kinnick Stadium by over 30 members of our local community. The protest interfered with a fundraiser holiday party for the University of Iowa. This institution, the university, was targeted because of its involvement in the genocide happening to Palestinian people. For historical context, the book Hundred Years War on Palestine by Rashid Khalidi is a great resource. Now, how is the University of Iowa relevant? The university has a 
partnership with Collins Aerospace, a company with a significant branch in nearby Cedar Rapids. I grew up here in Iowa City. I have a friend with multiple family members that work for Collins Aerospace. Another friend of mine has a younger sister who has just offered an internship with them. These are people we know with significant power to influence deadly decision making. This is not an issue beyond our scope of concern. Collins Aerospace is owned by RTX. RTX provides weapons and war technologies to Israel. The university also has a history of collaboration as recent as September with Lockheed Martin, a weapons manufacturer. Specifically, they are responsible for a $3 billion sale of F-35 fighter jets to Israel. The city of Iowa City would not exist as we know it without the University of Iowa. Let's reflect on what that means for Iowa City to be inextricable from an institution having profitable relationships with companies that supply weapons of death to Israel. Also, I encourage all of us to educate ourselves on the history and value of civil disobedience. Are we content with the arrest methods used last Saturday? These videos can be found on the Instagram sjp.iowacity. To conclude, Iowa City should not feel secure in its reputation of being a left-leaning oasis in the conservative Midwest. If this is how you see Iowa City, pre please reevaluate your comfort with this presumption and take action towards supporting those who are brave enough to disagree, critique, and interrupt the actions of institutions and people whose power otherwise goes unquestioned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Kufre Etuk, and I am a resident of Iowa City. Today I'm wearing black to represent the black stripe on the Palestinian flag that stands for the oppression and persecution that Palestinians have suffered for countless years. City Council of Iowa City, as your constituent and a member of the Iowa City community, I urge us to pay attention to our nation's co-signing of genocide. On December 11th, the world witnessed a raised hand, a hand raised in the support of the genocide of Palestinians. The United States vetoed a United Nations resolution calling for ceasefire in Gaza, reaffirming what we have all known for a long time, that the United States stands for the genocide of the 17,000 Palestinians that have been slaughtered by the Israeli defensive forces since October 7th, and the displacement of two million Palestinians in Gaza. People in Gaza are facing starvation and are lacking much needed medical care. Civilians are being used as collateral. The Biden administration cannot pretend to care for the well-being of Palestinians, cannot pretend to care for the human rights of Palestinians, and cannot pretend to care for the U.S. House Resolution 786 for immediate ceasefire and veto the United Nations Resolution of a Ceasefire. It is fully and completely contradictory. I urge the Council and its constituents to remember that the genocide of Palestine should matter to us all. Injustice everywhere inju endangers justice everywhere. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, my name is Kate Doolittle and I live in Iowa City. The forces enacting genocide in Palestine and the violent policing in Iowa City are intimately connected. U.S. police all over the country participate in exchange programs that train officers to use the same Israeli occupation force tactics against U.S. citizens that are used to murder and abuse Palestinians. Though to my knowledge the ICPD does not participate in such a program, the global policy of violent militarized policing is being weaponized against our community. On Saturday, my partner and other peaceful protesters were brutalized by the University of Iowa Police Department under the watch of the Iowa City Police Department. My partner's arm was wrenched behind their back and their wrist is now sprained and potentially fractured. Even after we were home safe, the video of their screams of agony literally made me sob. I physically could not watch it. On top of that, they were grossly mistreated at the Johnson County Jail, where they were put in solitary confinement for over five hours for being trans. They were offered no food and no medical evaluation for their wrist at any point between arrest and release, and were repeatedly made to do painful tasks like carry items to their cell despite their injury. Despite the fact that my partner was brutalized during arrest by a UIPD officer, the violence is grounds to file a complaint against ICPD with the Community Police Review Board, because Article 20-01-A3 of the Duty to Intervene and Report states all employees shall intervene if they observe or become aware of what they believe to be unnecessary or excessive use of force by an employee of another law enforcement agency. ICPD stood by and watched while peaceful protesters were violently attacked by university officers. I have absolutely no faith in the ICPD will be held accountable by the CPRB. Of the 20 allegations against ICPD in the CPRB 2022 annual report, Police Chief Dustin Listen sustained none and the CPRB sustained none. 
I was going to talk more about the awful details of that report, but I can't, so I'll just say that the multiple militarized police agencies in and around Iowa City cannot be separated from each other. They cannot be separated from the IOF waging genocide in Palestine. These agents of violence are all part of the same machine, the machine which murders and brutalizes U.S. citizens here, Palestinians there, with U.S. weapons and tax dollars. Thank you. Welcome, please state your name and city you're living in. Hello, my name is Izzy Kippis. I live in Iowa City. I'm a former student of the University of Iowa and I'm currently a employee at the University of Iowa. I work in cancer research. I'm also a transsexual woman. Earlier this year, the state of Iowa passed legislation banning teenagers from using from medical transition, banning children from using the restroom they feel most comfortable in, and banning teachers from using any name or pronouns other than the ones assigned to that child from their birth. Amid this, the University of Iowa invited Matt Walsh, current figurehead of the anti-trans movement, to speak at our school. I, I attended a protest against the UNI's inviting of an anti-trans speaker. Three weeks later, I was arrested for alleged actions relating to that protest. Four armed UIPD officers entered my workplace to handcuff me and escort me out to the jail to book me for simple misdemeanors. I was wearing scrubs. A month ago, UIPD arrested six more trans people at another anti-trans speaker event hosted by the university. Just on Saturday, UIPD, ICPD, and University Heights police brutalized four more trans protesters who were disrupting a fundraiser event. They utilized pain compliance techniques on kids whose hands were already restrained behind their backs. They even arrested an individual with no charges and no warrant and released him five minutes later. The UIPD cannot be allowed to continue acting with such ridiculous impunity. The Iowa State government and the U.S. federal government have stolen life-saving medicine from transgender youth, stolen any modicum of safety in their schools, and stolen roughly a fifth of each and every one of our paychecks, and used that money to criminalize dissent at home and murder children in Gaza. The metro area we all live in maintains an Iowa City Police Department, a Coralville Police Department, a North Liberty Police Department, a University Heights Police Department, and a University of Iowa Police Department. I ask that the city of Iowa City consider legislation that would restrict the university from maintaining its own privatized, milice, uh, militarized police force. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and city. Mandy Remington, Iowa City. I was not planning on speaking tonight because there is nothing that I can say about the atrocities that are happening in Palestine that has not been better said by those here tonight that are directly affected. And I have spoken out many times about my opinions on police responses to protesting in this town. What I can say and what I did learn over the last year is what it took for each one of you to get in the seat that you are in. And I know that you did not do it for the money. You did it for all of the people that you listened speaking to you tonight about things that are causing severe distress in their lives. So I ask you, as someone who worked hard to be your colleague over this last year, to please do not let this be another situation where you sit here and you listen to resident after resident come to you and ask something of you and you turn around and vote against them. You are not being asked to put your lives on the line. You are not even being asked tonight to make any extreme systemic policy change. You are being asked to make a statement. Listen to everybody that is here talking to you as their representatives. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and city. Newman Abu is a long time resident in Iowa City for 30 years. Thank you so much for hosting this forum today, for allowing us to speak. I really appreciated every one of the, those who spoke today. They spoke very articul articulate and very new information. Thank you so much for everybody who spoke today. I want to defend those students and young people who, are talk, who talk today, and I would expect you to do the same. The University of Iowa students, Democrats, spoke democ democratically, and they voted to issue a statement to say that the Palestinians should, be, should live long and free from the river to the sea. And one of the region, board, of, uh, board of Region members called them a bunch of idiots for saying that. And I think we are responsible to defend our students. The, the, I am also uh, the Arab American Caucus Chair in, uh, with the Iowa Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party should also defend them, not attack them like they did. And I expect you to, to defend those students as well. Israeli is trying to silence the truth 
by killing 65 journalists in the last two months. They don't want people to know what is the truth. They don't twist the truth. They upside the truth 180 degrees. They, they are doing the, the genocide and the ethnic cleansing, and they say that the Palestinians are doing that. They, they lie multiple times during their, 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 their uh, discourse of this course. At the end here, I just want to thank our mayor for attending the vigil uh, for the Palestinians. I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Council Member Zahir Saleh for attending one of the protests. And I would invite you to come and protest with us and be part of this learning process. And this is the only way we can solve this problem. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and city you live in. Yes, sir. Good evening. Salam, which means peace. My name is Mona O'Day. I am a North Liberty resident, and I've only lived here for about a year and a couple of months. I came from Columbus, Ohio, which has a much bigger Arab community uh, than here, um, and the voices are stronger actually in Columbus, Ohio, and um, the activism is Im amazing, and here it is too, I see. I was very pleasantly surprised. I think it is important to talk more also about what it means to be a Palestinian American. Uh, I was born in Germany, so I consider myself a Palestinian German American. Um, and I, even though I never lived in Palestine, I visited every two years as a child. And even as a child, not living under this occupation, uh, I've seen enough of it. Just getting through from Jordan to Palestine, at times as a child I would wish, boy, couldn't my family just live in Spain or Greece or we just get off the airport TSA and you're done? Not three checkpoints were humiliated, humiliated and humiliated. And one of the biggest humiliation that I remember as a child of seven, seven or eight, is that uh, it is chaotic on the uh, King Hussein Bridge, absolutely chaotic in the 90s. And one of the times I remember is that there was like a, um, like a curtain uh, that, is, uh, that can be mobile that was, I was separated from my father and my brother and it was just my mother and me and my sister. And as a child, I am scared of the IDF, I am, with the big guns that they sometimes point at you. Just as a citizen to visit your family passing through, nothing else. You can sometimes get those guns pointed at you. Never at me, I've never seen it with my mother, but I've seen it otherwise. So we were surrounded by this curtain and an IDF soldier, a female, came in. Oh, Thank okay. you. No problem. Thank you. I wanna thank everyone that came up and spoke today. Are you coming to speak? Okay, please come. I don't know if there's anyone in the hall that wants to speak, but I will allow, um, I will allow up to three more speakers. So we have one, we have a second. Is there anyone else? We'll just have these two. Welcome. Oh, all right, sorry, couldn't see. So we'll have these three. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Nicole Yeager. Uh, I live here in Iowa City. I'm a graduate student, but I'm reading a statement for Ionis uh, Alexikas, who's over at the Angular right now, a uh, lifelong Iowa Cityan. Uh, I am here alongside friends, colleagues, and acquaintances in demanding the support of US House Resolution 786 for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Palestine and reject Biden's 14.3 billion military aid to Israel. This is a call for peace and ending this is an ongoing genocide supported by our governor, our university, and our president. Additionally, I would like to condemn the actions of the university and Iowa City Police against the December 9th protesters, as well as the targeted protesters who were arrested a month after the demonstration. Twisting arms and wrists to extremes and putting hands on the throats of demonstrators who showed no resistance only represents the actions of bullies, has no place in our community. These institutions have also demonstrated clear prioritization to surveil, target, and arrest trans members of our community as perpetuated by the governor's agenda to dis dismiss their lives. 
We demand that the violence end. The United States must end their support of this apartheid, and we demand that the University of Iowa cut all ties and partnerships with the various weapons manufacturers. We ask that you please set the example here in Iowa City and tell Governor that Iowa City demands a permanent ceasefire. I'd also like to add that there's a long, meaningful history of community members and students standing for what is right in Iowa City. It is your duty to ensure peaceful demonstrations in this community don't turn into civil civilians being brutalized. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hey, Brandon Ross from Iowa City. Uh, I'm I'm second generation American. My mom's family's from Ukraine and we're Jewish. And so this is a rough period. Um, an important thing to know is that 60% uh, of people do not want to send uh, any more weapons into Ukraine. And 70% of people in this country have been pulled to find that they don't want to send any more weapons into Israel. And uh, unfortunately, our Congress, only 3% agree with them. 3% agree with the vast majority of U.S. citizens. Uh, both situations the U.S. has taken full advantage of and is to be condemned. The U.S. is arming uh, basically a right-wing uh, nationalist government in Israel who is destroying lives in uh, Palestine. In Ukraine, the U.S., uh, which helped overturn the elected president in 2014, Viktor Yanukovych, has been arming uh, violent Nazi, uh, fascist, and neo-Nazi uh, groups uh, since 2014. Um, and they have been pushing for war through both uh, unpopular regimes of Poroshenko, who left office with 9% approval rating lowest in the world, and Zelensky, whose approval rating is now below 20%. So this is not what we Ukrainians call our government, is not this government and hasn't been uh, for, since 2014. But the U.S. uses Ukraine as a battleground to get at Russia, which is their major project. And that's really what we're doing. Uh, and from 2014 to 2022, uh, the regime in Kiev had bombed hospitals and, and schools and orphanages and infrastructure and killed over 2,000 children, over 16,000 Eastern Ukrainians. Those are Ukrainians. We did not come to help them. Uh, and finally, Russia interceded. So please, please, Get on the phone, get on the typer, get in the street, stop funding of weapons to these two countries. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Please state your name and city you're from. Hi, Elisa Meggett, Iowa City. I didn't plan on speaking tonight, but I want to finish a story from our sister here from Ohio who is about to address human rights abuses at the checkpoints in Palestine. And I'm, I'm sad she didn't get a chance. I would love her to tell her many, many stories. I can tell you I've been to Palestine once for one week. And in the course of that short time, I witnessed an old man being abused by the IDF at a checkpoint where he, they took his walking cane out of his trunk and accused him of bearing a weapon in his car. And they intimidated him and they shook it at him and they screamed at him and they sent him off without his cane. Um, the way it works in Palestine, if you understand the disparities, the roads there, all the funding goes to the Israeli roads. The Palestinian roads are very decrepit and, 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 and unnavigable. And so this man's going to have to park far, far away inadequately, and he's going to have to walk home without any cane or walking support. Um, the same week I was there up in Nablus, the IDF shot students, two boys that were, or a group of boys that were playing uh, soccer. And as the kids were trying to approach him to help him, the, the IDF soldier stood on him with his backpack and his gun and let the kid bleed out. And every time the kids tried to come up and support their friend, he would point his gun at them. So he literally stood on top of the child until he died. This happens every day. I want to invite city council and the people in the room and listening to um, join If Americans Only Knew with Allison Ware. Every day they give fantastic updates. There's so much we need to know. And as elected officials representing all of us in Iowa City, I invite you to show your leadership as a community and to express your opposition to this carnage happening in Gaza and support the ceasefire and to really address the police abuse that recently happened. I think if it was a protest for Israel and support of Israel, that wouldn't have happened. And I, I'm not, yeah. Thank you.
I want to appreciate um, all those that uh, weren't able to speak. Thank you for showing up into your city hall. And um, we heard a lot here today. And we just appreciate everybody taking the time to come. Thank you. We're going to move on to planning and zoning matters. We'll pause for a minute. And will you all close the door when you leave? Thank you so much. We're on to planning and zoning matters. Item 8A is zoning code amendment, reduction of maximum allowable height in the RNS 12 zone. This is an ordinance amending Title 14 zoning to reduce the maximum allowable height in the neighborhood stabilization residential zone from 35 feet to 27 feet for single family and duplex uses. I'm gonna open the public hearing. And all right, so this is kind of a, um, we had deferred this item and now we're, we had a meeting with our uh, planning and zoning commission during our work session today. And now is our opportunity to have this discussion once again, council. Is there, the staff presentation was given to us on 11-21 um, at our last formal meeting. Um, are there any questions from the council to staff? I, I do have one. I do have one too. Okay. Um, <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors? Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. All right. Um, so, so the South District Form Based Code, can you all speak a little bit to that? We heard a comment earlier that they're limited to two and a half stories. So, if you can just kind of speak to that. 
Yeah, that's that's true. The South District form-based code is a form-based zone, so it has different standards, and it's based on stories. So it is a maximum allowable height of two and a half stories. All of our residential zones have a maximum of 35 feet. Can stories, can two and a half stories um, reach the 35 foot? Well, I, in the South District form-based code, there's also a feet um, maximum. So it's both stories and feet. So it's height is calculated entirely differently in the form-based code than it is in our residential, our standard residential districts, which is just a standard foot measurement. Okay. Um, I guess one last question, and hopefully it can be answered. So can a property be 35 foot feet in the in the South District? Oh, in the in the new form based code. Yeah. So it's it's measured differently. So a thirty five foot building in the South District form based code is different than a thirty five foot height limit in a standard residential zone because um, in a, the standard residential zone in the RNS 12, it's 35 feet from average grade to the midpoint of the roof. And the, the height is calculated differently in um, the South District. So even if it could get to 35 feet, it would be a different measurement and it's measured differently. And I don't, I don't know off the top of my head the, how, exactly how the measurement is calculated in the South District. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna sound like I'm seven, but <laughs> to the eye, yeah. would two and a half stories in the South District based form based code look? Would it be in proportion with the, the thirty five foot? Feet? Probably not. Just it would like probably be. It would probably look smaller. You know, from last time when you guys give us information, I wrote like some question here, but we did not talk about it because we postponed it. So I just want to ask you, like, when we say 27 and 35, is 27 equal to 2.5 story? Or, and the 35, three? Or, because the difference is not that big. Yeah, so I guess um, if, I guess I, what I would say is if, um, the council is inclined to reduce the height limit. Staff would recommend that we keep the measurement in feet and not use stories mm -hmm. um, for this particular zoning district because it is a standard residential zone where we measure it in feet. So um, I'm not sure that that answers your question, but um, two and, you could still have a two and a half story house that's 35 feet in, in the RNS 12 zone. What about the 27? You could have a two and a half story also in building the that's 27 feet, yeah. Okay, my other question was, I think uh, somebody mentioned last time is 17, house it has been demolished, six was okay, barrier to the land being resumed to RNS 12, and nine or 11 was 27 or less. Is it that accurate? Yeah, so we did an a analysis of demolitions within the RNS 12 zone since 1992, and there have been 17 demolitions in that spe specific zone since 1992. Six of those demolitions occurred before the RNS 12 zone even existed, so those were still multifamily zones at the time. Um, in addition, we also looked at, of the demolitions that occurred and redevelopment that occurred, what are these new structures? What are the height of these new structures? And so we've, we found, we were able to find building plans for 11 of the 17 that were demolished. Mm -hmm. And nine of those were 27 feet or less. So our conclusion is that the 35 foot height, maximum allowable height, is, is not an incentive to redevelop. The redevelopment that we have seen for the most part is 27 feet or less. Thank you. Hearing no other questions, thank you. All right, anyone from the public like to address this topic? Uh, please come up and state your name and city you're from. 
And if you have a sticker, you can drop it in the basket. If you're online and you want to address this topic, please raise your hand at this time. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jim Throgmorton. I live in Iowa City. It's really hard talking about this topic after listening to the discussion about Palestine and what's happening in Gaza and so on. Uh, it's just really difficult to do. But I want to address one topic, and that is, where did this number 35 feet come from? The answer is it came from a model zoning code drafted by Herbert Hoover when he was working in the Commerce Department back in the 1920s, 1927 in particular. The model code that he and his fellow uh, people developed was simple, and it, it was crafted, and its crafters thought that the code could be applied nationwide. The 35-foot height limit in the code, in that code was based on mansion districts in big cities like New York and Chicago, where 35-foot tall houses for the wealthy were not uncommon. Many communities quickly adopted the standards with little or no change. But over time, most cities found that they had to alter the model code to reflect local conditions. In Iowa City, the 35-foot limit was adopted to allow walk-in basements on sloping lots. There are no significant sloping lots in the north side's part of the RNS-12 zone, and only one little stretch of, I think it's Washington Street, that has that kind of condition. Just because the 35-foot height limit has been in place since Herbert Hoover, is not a good reason to keep it, especially if it's harmful to tightly packed properties, narrow lots, uh, frontage lots in the RNS-12 zone. So you might think about that. It's, it's not something written in stone that must be followed for particular reasons. Instead, it's just been around for about 100 years. And if you look carefully at the conditions on the ground, a 27-foot height limit would make a lot more sense than a 35-foot one in the RNS-12 district. Thanks. Thank you. We're going to move online to Susan. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. I came down earlier to speak in person and there was no place to sit. Um, so I want to appreciate the council for allowing all of that time and space for the public comments and also for making the Zoom uh, option possible um, for me to, to continue to participate. Um, I just wanted to add a few things to um, the points that I raised in the earlier hearing. I won't repeat those, but again, um, I, my husband and I live on the near north side on Fairchild Street um, in the district that's affected. If you walk around this um, district, uh, you, you can see what makes it unique from most other neighborhoods in Iowa City, the mix of large old homes, including the home of our um, former mayor or I'm sorry, of the first woman mayor of Iowa City, Emma Harvat, and also the small brick and stone houses from the early days of Iowa City mixed in with the small immigrant cottages in Goose Town. It's a very diverse neighborhood already. The city has just invested many um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in helping to maintain the historic brick streets in the neighborhood. And the neighbors here, as I said before, for, for many decades have worked hard to help maintain and stabilize the neighborhood. A couple things that you don't see when you walk around the neighborhood that I wanted to point out are that of the um, 990 some properties in the north side neighborhood, which is just a part of the RNS 12 zone, um, only 48% of them are single family um, and owner occupied homes. The another 25% are either condos or two-family duplexes, um, and, and another 26 are other types of dwellings. In the block we live in, um, which is only partly in the historic district, one side of the block has two single-family homes, one large older home that is a rental, a duplex on one corner, and a fourplex on the other corner. Changes in height and density in this part of town make a much 
bigger difference than they do in most other neighborhoods. And I think the council and the staff and planning and zoning, I really appreciate the extra time you've taken to review this. And also to point out that there are other places in, in the city like the South Side where we've made efforts to tailor zoning more appropriately to the neighborhood. And I would just ask you again to um, support the neighborhood's effort to do that in this RS-12 zone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else want to address this topic? Great. Hi, Welcome. my name is Sharon DeGraw, and I have two visuals. Um, Left side, the third one down. Oh. And we won't start the time until we get this started. <clears throat> And state the city you're from, please. I'm from Iowa City. Great. And I live in the north side. And so much of the RNS 12 that's in the north side is in the southern end of the, the north side neighborhood. Um, there are some properties that are, are cutouts. And while it might just be like one property, if it's built to 35 feet tall, it will affect numerous neighboring properties, sort of like a ripple effect. Um, the visual that I have here is an example of 114 North Governor, and it is relatively new construction, I think around 2018, and it looks big. It's got a hefty presence, yet it's about 23 feet when you measure uh, the front facade, and it's the two stories, and then you pick the halfway point of the the apex of that third story, and that's at 23 feet. And then there's also an averaging between the left side of the structure and the right side of the structure. So even though the right side looks like a bigger building, it's averaged out, and that's how the 23 feet is, is there. Um, so that's a, a very, it's a nice building duplex that fits into the neighborhood. If you were to imagine another story going on top with a flat top roof um, and reaching 35 feet, that would make a kind of impact in the neighborhood that really starts to ripple out and affect who wants to live in the neighboring properties or who wants to buy a house there. And that's the neighborhood integrity that we're, we're trying to keep in place so that it's a livable place for everyone. Um, And this one, too, oh, excuse me. This one too is at 915 Washington Street, and it's a duplex that was built in 2012. It's actually a little taller, yet once again it fits in. It's 26 feet. Um, and then if you imagine, if it had one full level on and another five feet on top of that, that's where it would start to be 35 feet tall. And it's the flat top roof modern construction. So here's the one that um, sort of started off the controversy. But once we understood that this is something that could be built in the north side and in RNS 12 neighborhoods, it has a garage level dedicated to the first floor. The two living spaces would be floors two and three. Um, the average height is 35 feet, but at its tallest point, it reaches 38 feet. So that's that's something that really affects the neighboring properties. It uh, will cast shadows. We're now talking about adding solar panels on some of the houses in the north side, but I think oops, Thank you. that would in influence people Thank not you. to do that. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. Hi. Hi, my name is Nancy Carlson, and I'm asking you to please support the 27 foot height in the RNS 12 zone. I was one of the group of neighbors involved in bringing about <coughs> this zone. We were and still are concerned about maintaining a level playing field for all neighbors who want to make this neighborhood their home. I believe this height requirement accomplishes this goal. For decades, this height or less has been respected. 
It has not been an impediment to the growth of our area, but allowed houses and people of various income levels to be allowed to build here. This is a tradition we would like to continue. In November, the City Council passed numerous amendments to our zoning code, including one allowing 30 feet, 6,000 square feet lots in the RNS 12 zone. The rezoning, or the reasons behind this rezoning change was to reduce the cost of land to make smaller houses more economically feasible in our zone. However, with the existing 35 feet allowance, it provides a wonderful opportunity for developers to shoehorn in larger homes on smaller lots. This jeopardizes already existing smaller homes and makes opportunities for smaller homes to be developed later on more unlikely. It allows houses out of size with the, it allows houses out of size with the rest of the neighborhood. It puts pressure on owners of smaller lots to sell to this group. If our developers are good business people, which they are, they will take op they will take advantage of this opportunity because their goal is to get the best return possible on their investment. If you do not believe this, you are as naive as I was when I moved into this neighborhood 40 years ago. We are not responsible for this situation. We are only trying to make the playing field as even as possible. To that end, we are asking for a 27 height limit. Thank you. Thank you. Good Welcome. evening, my name is Karen Cubby. I live in Iowa City, and I am uh, standing before you to request that you approve the 27-foot limit. And I think Nancy really kind of made the point that the recently approved zoning changes are the thing that is different from the past when other houses were demolished and things were built. The development pressure over time is just greater and with the increased density allowed through those zoning changes approved in November, it changes the playing field. And there are, I believe, a whole host of unintended consequences are gonna happen about assessed values and taxes for everyone in those neighborhoods. But this height reduction can help mitigate the feel on the street. And I know I've thought about this in terms of downtown, that we wouldn't have higher density or taller buildings, how the design of them can allow the increased density but mitigate the feel on the street. So we kind of get the best of both worlds. So for those of you who supported the zoning changes before that increased the number of units that will happen, and I don't think they will be affordable, um, the height decrease can mitigate some of those unintended consequences. So I hope you'll support the 27 feet. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic from the public? Seeing no one in, in, uh, in person or online, I'm gonna close the public hearing. And could I give, uh, could I get a first consideration please? So moved, Alter. Second, Taylor. All right. Just want to remind the council again that um, we had the conversation with our commissioners uh, earlier today. Um, it This item did pass. Well, they had a different motion than we had before us today. So their motion was to maintain the current 35 um, height maximum, and it did pass four to three. What we're talking about now, or what we're gonna be voting on, is um, reducing the maximum allow, um, allowance from 35 to 27. So I know it was a little confusing mm -hmm. about the votes, but I just wanted to make that clarification again. And it sounds like as well, so the the commission is, the, excuse me, the commission is recommending denial of this amendment. Mm -hmm. So right. for us to vote, we would have to be voting for it, correct? 
So if you want to, if you're voting with the commissioners, with the majority vote of the commissioners, then you would deny the item that's before us today. I know it's confusing. So a, a yes vote is 27 feet. A no vote keeps it at yes, 35 feet. Could, yeah, that's <laughs> yes. a good one. Clarity. Yes. Yes. I'll mention yeah. it again before we vote because I imagine with your discussions that might get yeah. lost again. Yeah, I can start if nobody wants to. I think like after hearing all these conversations, you know, and um, I, I just believe that we should, you know, keep the 27 or reduce to the 27, whatever. I'm with the 27 because I really believe that uh, keeping the characteristics of the neighborhood is very important for me, and uh, giving. When I asked earlier, the 35 is three story, and the 27 is kind of two or two and a half, I meant by that I would like to know if somebody will have this big room to come and just do a whole new story, or you know, by just demolishing the old neighborhood characteristics by building new building, and that will add just like more expensive house, because nowadays it, the building is very expensive. So if we, if the developer came and bought old, for like all the, you know, houses and just build new one, that's what really gonna be expensive. You know, that we are not gonna accept that it will be affordable at all. So I, I will vote to reduce the height. I will vote yes to reduce the height to 27. I also will be voting to reduce it to 25. I kept waiting to hear any valid reasons for having it at 35, and I, I just hadn't heard that, but I'd heard many, obviously, logical reasons uh, for making it 27. So I would be voting in favor of this amendment to uh, make uh, keep it 27. Um, so I've got notes from reading and from listening and from the last meeting and the meeting before and uh, so at any rate I'm trying to put together a jumble as well as a lot of public input um, I'll cut to the chase and say that I'm in favor of a yes vote for the 27 um, with a full nod to staff about the need for consistency and the desire for consistency and that it is more complicated however by within its own report and by some of the further um, information that you provided us, very few properties are actually impacted by this to begin with um, in terms of what the overlay is as well as the, um, of the historic and the, oh my gosh, and the north side. Sorry, I'm not going to get that right, but you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, between that and the amount that has actually been demoed, I think that it, it stands to reason to keep it at a lower level to keep it consistent with the neighborhood and that it does sort of create a sort of mosaic of sorts with the zoning code or the zoning amendments that we passed already. So I think ultimately with full understanding that just to sort of throw things at staff and with best practices for consistency and to essentially say, no, never mind. I would be given much more pause on that if it were not for the fact that it seems that this is a very small number of homes that are not protected and yet should be. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping for the best out of um, both situations, um, but I do think that it fits best for a 27 foot um, height requirement uh, and hopefully the, the burden on staff will be less than anticipated. I'm also in support of the 27 foot height limit. Um, I, th I felt uh, in terms of the concerns and arguments, uh, the, the last statement from the North Side Neighborhood Association uh, provided some, I thought, compelling arguments um, in, their, in their report, um, which I won't go through tonight. I thought about doing that, but I, I won't be doing that. I also heard some very compelling arguments today during the uh, confer with um, PNZ. Um, I thought all three in support of the 27 foot height limit had some very yeah. compelling arguments. Um, <clears throat> I had thought, and, and we'll read, um, 
the statement from Ann Furks, which came a while back. Um, and and I want to give a shout out to Ann. I want to give a shout out to uh, <clears throat> Nancy uh, Carlson, because they both were involved in the rezonings back in the 1990s. They have been working on neighborhood stability issues uh, in the core neighborhoods for 30 years, and they are still working on those issues. Um, so I want to thank them for their work on that uh, and continuing um, to, to work on trying to establish stability in the center of town. Uh, and so Anne wrote a letter, uh, which I'll read portions of. Uh, she wrote, recent proposals for three-story, 35-foot tall houses in the RNS 12 zone have revealed a loophole that is counter the, to the intent of the zone to stabilize and preserve existing neighborhoods. I urge, urge the commission, she wrote this to Planning and Zoning, to approve the Northside Neighborhoods request to bring the allowed building heights in line with the existing houses in the RNS 12 zone. That will not only apply to the north side, but will be beneficial to South Lucas and the Governor Streets. And I think I wanted to highlight that statement she made about the request would bring the allowed building heights in line with the existing houses in the RNS 12 zone. We've had a lot of, if, in reading through the all the material, and there's a volume of material on this thing. It's kind of amazing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on the character of the neighborhood. What is the character of the neighborhood? And I think Anne basically is speaking to that in saying that if we bring the allowed building heights in line with the existing, existing houses in the RNS 12 zone, it is that height which is characteristic of the RNS 12 zones, which is what in part contributes to its character. So by dropping the height to 27 feet, we are, we are now zoning, the zoning language is consistent with the character of the neighborhood. I think it's also, I'll just leave with um, another, another point that I, I think may be relevant here as well, and that is, you know, we have changed the zoning code, the amendments you know, have incentivized, um, tried to promote further development. In my view, the, the, the notion of missing middle, you know, the use of, say, the duplex in this instance um, as a means of increasing density is most effective if the buildings are all at the same height. We, we really want that to be the, the consistency in which the missing middle can be applied so that it's more effective as a kind of soft density, which is how it's often referred to. It's not a density that draws attention to itself. And in order to not uh, draw attention to itself, it needs to be at the same height as the rest of the other buildings. If you, if you build that duplex at 35 feet, that is not consistent with the character of the neighborhood. And so it's no longer um, a soft density or a hidden density. It's actually distinguishing itself from, from the you know, the fabric of the neighborhood. So I think the, the idea of increasing, you know, making those changes to the zoning amendment um, will be more effective if the 27 building height is consistent throughout the neighborhood. Um, so those are my thoughts, and I want to thank everybody for their perseverance on this, um, and uh, I will be supporting the 27-foot height. A nice vote to end on, by the way, for me, uh, as, a, as a final um, vote on planning and zoning <coughs> matters. So thank you, Council, for supporting this. Um, also very appreciative of the amount of public engagement we've gotten on this issue. and. Um, I'm struggling with this because it's a it's a process challenge for me. I think um, I just want us to be really honest with ourselves about what this change may or may not do. I don't think it will impact affordability in the neighborhoods. I, I think the the number of um, lots that it will affect is so relatively small that the likelihood of it impacting overall affordability is low. 
it will not address design standards. We can, this, if we say 27 feet, you can get a 27 foot modern flat roof <laughs> building that I think would look out of character in, in the neighborhoods. Um, I also really hesitate to signal that we would be making a change to our zoning code that might be for the purpose of favoring people who already own homes in the area over those who have not yet had an opportunity to own homes in the area. I think that's something that we have to remain cognizant of because those who haven't yet had an opportunity to live in these neighborhoods don't have a voice here tonight other than what we may take into consideration. Um, I think, you know, in, in spite of all that, I guess I would say I just want to be honest about those those observations or those things that I feel strongly about. I do agree with uh, Councillor Thomas with your point about the recent changes that we made in terms of the overall um, kind of feel and intent of the neighborhood stabilization. So I'll support this amendment. I just hope that, um, you know, when a building that looks very much like the 35 foot one that was objectionable is built at 27 feet that we knew what we were doing. Just kind of, <clears throat> without repeating what has been said, uh, kind of piggybacking off uh, of maybe the last three comments. Um, for me, one of my motivating factors in making decisions like this is uh, revolves around the ideas of, is it something that could potentially have an impact on affordable housing? So somebody that spoke earlier, talked about um, the earlier, a couple times been referenced, some of the earlier changes we made, uh, which I was in support of. A um, lot of them, but for the sake of simplicity, adding the mid-block duplexes, those, that batch of changes. Um, even though there was some neighborhood resistance to that, I still supported that because I could see that as, a, as an effect that would possibly increase the ability for density, which, although it's not a silver bullet, would be a good part in the shotgun approach to trying to do something about housing in this city. Um, so in that case, I, you know, that, that was my motivating factor. Since I don't really see that the, the extra eight feet from 27 or however many feet, 27 to 35 feet, that that, th that 35 foot would get us that, really have much impact on the density question the same way the duplex would. I think this is one of those times when I find myself uh, sympathetic to the neighborhood folks that have come out and said we really want this for these, um, uh, these reasons, for the character of the neighborhood. Um, and I don't see the dropping from 35 to 27 as having a profound effect on you know, uh, keeping us from, from increasing the density. So I too will be supporting the 27 foot um, uh, change. So I appreciate everybody coming out in, uh, for weeks and, and sharing, um, I guess not specifically on this matter, but related matters. Um, as I, I, I had a conversation with um, f folks from the north side a, a while back um, about the height, and I go back to Jeff Speck, who, um, when I came on this council, that was like the book to read, and Missing Middle was all there. It was diversity, giving people opportunity. It even talked about having neighborhoods where there are million-dollar homes <laughs> with affordable housing in the middle. And, and so I'm a little confused where we are today by some of those champions, I guess, and not, not discounting um, or judging, but just a little confused by this particular a carving out um, and not applying that premise to the entire city. There are missing voices here tonight. There are some people that reached out to me that said, you know, they don't feel comfortable coming and speaking um, because they don't want to be odd. They don't want to mm -hmm. feel, you know, weird because they're not in op they're they're in opposition of changing from 35 to 27, and they don't want to feel awkward amongst their neighbors. I have a picture up and I and actually when I when I brought up this picture is where I grew up in Chicago. 
It was uh, Bob Welsh. <laughs> I was talking about housing, and he was talking about Human Rights City. Um, and I brought up Chicago, and he told me after that meeting, don't you ever talk about Chicago. It was in a nice way, because people envision Chicago as something kind of negative. Um, and we had a great conversation about it. I, I, and Reverend uh, Bob Walsh is um, a, a wonderful person. But I'm going to talk about a little bit about like where I grew up. It was a a three story, where everything else around is two story or one story. On the corner, there is a big um, we call them courtway buildings, where there's about 20 units of families living there. On the opposite corner. Um, it took away our view <laughs> of the downtown uh, Sears Tower, now different name. Uh, a, a church was built on the corner. Um, we enjoyed that view for many, many years, but it went away. So I don't see how having missing middle diversity given individuals opportunity to live, you know, in the north side, um, or in this district, reducing that from 35 or, you know, not having that 35, I, I just don't see it when we're talking about being this um, equitable city where we want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity. So I respect all the comments today. I won't be voting. I, so I will be voting no um, on this agenda item. Um, and again, I, I really do appreciate everybody coming and sharing their thoughts. Um, I respect them. I have a different thought process on this matter. Um, it seemed like it's going to pass, so uh, just I needed to be authentic with my own personal beliefs on this matter. So, any other comments? Roll call, please. All right, again, for clarity, uh, so a yes vote amends it down to 27 feet. A no vote retains it at 35 feet. Sala? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? No. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes six to one. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved, Harmson. Second, Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. <laughs> We're at item number 9A, cell of 320 North Governor Street. Resolution authorizing conveyance of a single family home located at 320 North Governor Street. I'm gonna open the public hearing. And welcome Tracy Heishu. Hello, Tracy Heishu with Neighborhood Development Services. Um, in the recent past, um, we had uh, two condemnations that we went through. Um, one of the properties was on the one tonight, 320 North Governor. We had nuisance and property issues since 2018. That was the reason why we abated it um, due to, or sorry, condemned it due to the serious nature of it. We bought the house through an appraisal process for 106,000. We then listed the house with a realtor, and we negotiated a sale for $115,000. Um, we have expenses probably over about $148,000, but those include um, items for property acquisition, condemnation costs, appraisal costs, insurance, property taxes, and repair costs to secure the building. We have have that purchase agreement. The, there's an addendum to the purchase offer that basically says the buyer can do one of two things. They can either demo within 90, 90 days or they can renovate the property. And so the buyer indicated to us that their plans is to renovate, but they can do either. And if they renovate, they have to go to immediately secure the roof. If you've been out there, there's a huge hole in the roof with a lot of subsequent damage throughout the house. Um, they have to immediately, like I said, secure the roof and to take out all the overgrowth. And so to, they have to abate the nuisances that the house created um, that poses. So um, if they renovate, they have to have a building permit within 60 days and they have to have a certificate of occupancy issued within 18 months. So this is the resolution, resolution to convey the house to the buyer. And the buyer is, to our understanding, a roofing contractor. So if anyone's probably gonna renovate this house, it's probably gonna be a roofing contractor. And if you have any questions, all right. Great. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? 
If you're online, please raise your hand. Or in person, seeing no one. I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So move. Second, Taylor. Moved by Salise, seconded by Taylor. Council discussion. I like the fact that it appears that it'll be renoed rather than demoed. So, mm -hmm. I mean, but regardless, it's nice that there's movement on this one way or another. And um, I hope it's, it's in a great location. So I, I hope that it turns out well. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Sella? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number nine B, aid to agencies funding process. Resolution adopting the aid to agencies process and rescinding. Resolution 18-214. Can I get a motion to approve, please? Move. Second, Thomas. All right, moved by Sala, uh, seconded by Thomas, and welcome, Erica. Hi, Erica Kubley with Neighborhood Services. Like so this agenda item would replace our 2018 aid to agency resolution that describes eligibility and the funding process. Aid to agency provides nonprofit public service agencies with flexible operational funding to serve low-income Iowa City residents based on the priorities set in our five-year consolidated plan. Funding is split into two eligibility categories, legacy and emerging. The bulk of the aid to agency funding is allocated in a competitive funding round to a core group of 22 service providers called legacy agencies. Um, applications are submitted through the United Way joint funding process and awards are made on a two-year cycle. Up to 5% of the program budget is awarded to emerging agencies, which are funded annually. Um, the program was initially created for newer developing nonprofits, but once the legacy agencies were established a few years back, we shifted eligibility so that any nonprofit who wasn't a legacy agency could apply for the emerging funds. Um, the aid agency program has evolved quite a bit over the past five years, and last year during the legacy funding round, we ran into an unanticipated situation where one legacy agency was not not awarded funding. Um, at that time, the Housing and Community Development Commission recommended that we allow that agency to apply for emerging funds. However, based on the way the 2018 resolution was written, they were not eligible to apply that year. So in the proposed resolution today, we revised the emerging eligibility so that any agency that is not receiving leg legacy funds in a given fiscal year is eligible to apply for emerging funds. And this only affects one agency in the upcoming application round that will open later this month. Um, the resolution also updates the overall program guidelines to align with how we are currently administering funds. At this time, we also have a Housing and Community Development Commission subcommittee reviewing the aid to agency funding process in partnership with aid agency impact coalition representatives and other, fun other funders that participate in the joint funding process. The subcommittee is scheduled to present their recommendations to the full commission on, at our January 11th meeting. Any major changes recommended during the, this process would come to council before the next legacy funding round that will start in August of next year. So for tonight, we just have a minor update to the definition so that we can implement them ahead of our FY25 emerging agency funding allocation. Thank you. Great. Any questions? I just want to summarize. So the only thing that we're concerned with tonight is about basically opening up the emerging agency pool for any legacy agency that has been denied through their funding mechanism. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess also I, I was trying to ask the same question. Uh, and we know that this is like two year thing, so this year will be normal. This is going to be affect next year, right? This is for the FY25 funding round, which we are, um, we are beginning in December. We'll put on applications. The one that they just approved it was for which year? So we approved um, FY24 and FY25 together for legacy agencies. So any legacy that got funding last year will get two years. Um, yes. But the one agency could apply this year, get emerging, and then apply again next year for two years of legacy funding and get back on the cycle if they were awarded funding. Makes sense. Doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does not because I don't know. I uh, guess like uh, if you talk, I I don't know. But we have to, I have to give you examples so I can understand. 
So we, I know that, you know. Before you start, just make sure you're asking questions. Because yeah. we'll be able to deliberate in a little bit. Yeah, that's a question, right? Yes. But yes. I, I want to give an example in my okay. question. Great. Yeah, I, I guess like I know that there is one uh, agency did not been approved by the uh, by the HCCDC, and but the council approved them. You mean the same agency? They they have to come and apply for? No, this is no. this is referring to a different agency that was not funded by council either. But so. they can they can be eligible to apply for. Uh, American to agency, right? Because yes. now it will be okay for them to do it, right? Correct. Yep. Oh, that's the one I want. Yep. I just want to understand. They don't have to wait two years. They can just apply as soon as it open, right? Right. Okay. Thank you. Right. All right. No other questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person and seeing no hands raised online, council discussion. I just have to say I'm perpetually um, impressed with the way that staff and commissions, in this case, work to find like the next opportunity instead of just saying, well, that's the rule, that's how it is, right? That there's always a way to try to improve and help the process actually for the recipients. Um, I mean, this is specific to HCDC, but like time and again, I just see it happen where it's like, okay, well, somehow we haven't accounted for an opportunity. Let's see how that we can tweak something. So I just, I appreciate the efforts both of the commission and staff to do this. Yeah, I do too, really, because, uh, you know, some agency might like, really work hard to become legacy and they rely on that, you know, f if they are not eligible for any reason and th the st the commission decide to open it, I think that was a really good move from them doing that. And now, uh, you know, it's been now approved as policy came. So thank you for everything that you guys do. Roll call, please. Teague. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Alter. Yes. Burgess. Yes. Harmson. Yes. Saleh. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number nine C, fiscal year 2024 ARPA worker retention incentive. Resolution authorizing a fiscal year 2024 one-time worker reten retention incentive bonus for ASME, administrative, confidential, and executive employees. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Thomas. Second, Taylor. All right, and we're gonna ask our city manager, Jeff, to kind of lead us here. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is the first of three items uh, pertaining to employee wages for the AFSCME admin, uh, confidential, and executive uh, employees. Uh, this first one is the uh, one-time worker retention incentive bonus. Uh, and this applies to this fiscal year. So fiscal year 24, the current fiscal year that we are in. Uh, this action would utilize 1.2 million in federal ARPA dollars uh, to provide for equal worker retention incentive bonuses to employees uh, in those two work groups. Uh, the total amount of the retention incentives, uh, that 1.2 estimate there, is uh, about 2.75% of the budgeted wages for these employee groups in the current fiscal year. And that 2.75, how that number was arrived at, is that's the approximate difference in the annual pay, pay plan adjustments between these two employee groups and those covered under your public safety bargaining agreements. That would be your police and fire uh, bargaining units, and that looks back at the last three years. So 2.75 is roughly the difference in those annual increases over the last three years. Uh, the way this would be administered would be uh, that 2.75 percent, again roughly 1.2 million, would be uh, divided equally amongst the active employees as of December 15th. And if approved, the payroll would run on December 22nd. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Hearing no questions, we're going to go to public discussion. Anyone want to comment on this item? And if you are online, please raise your hand. Yep, 
thank you. Please state your name and city. Hello, my name is Megan Vollenweiter and I live in Iowa City. I also work for the city of Iowa City down in the purchasing department here at City Hall. Um, I'm also the vice president of AFSME Local 183. Um, and back at the end of September, we kind of sent up the bat signal and we wanted to let you know um, about how economic conditions have been affecting city employees. Um, and how that's affected not just our, um, like our own personal livelihoods, but also retention and attracting talented employees to the city as we were watching our coworkers leave for other opportunities. Um, and it, it appears that you guys have heard us and uh, we've gotten this uh, two-part answer. Um, the worker retention incentive one time this winter and then um, the pay plan amendments um, for fiscal year 25, um, which I think are answer our call in a big way. Um, I think it would make a huge difference for existing employees, especially as we head into, for many employees, the holiday season. Um, and then uh, next year with the across the board increase is um, something that uh, is, it builds for the future. Um, it's very forward thinking. And so uh, we just want to encourage a, a yes vote, if a yes is the, the way to go on this one. <laughs> um, so, and that's, that's true um, of the incentive and the, the pay plan amendment. And so I just, uh, that way I don't have to talk on all three or all two. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, howdy, David Sterling, Iowa City resident. Um, <clears throat> I have comments for the, the next agenda item, so I'll just keep this one brief. Uh, uh, the $1,000 that I would receive from this would go towards uh, the second vehicle I've ever owned in my life. The uh, first one was $300 and broke four months later, uh, but it did allow me to move uh, in the year that I did move. Um, it would have been cheaper than a U-Haul. Uh, yeah, so uh, just keeping it brief, I hope you consider this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion? I think um, uh, what you said earlier, Megan, about sending up the bat signal, and so thank you for doing that, um, uh, for, for you and the rest of ASME coming to us and sharing what's been going on, so information, just something we, we may or may not be aware of, uh, but certainly you made sure that we were, and so, uh, that has been incredibly important. I hope you will continue to keep those lines of communication open. Also, thank you to uh, Jeff and city staff for crunching the many numbers involved in this and uh, also coming up with a plan that it seems like everybody is, is happy with. So I think that's a really nice resolution to this, um, uh, to, to this call for help. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that it was so well received. Yes, that, I, I agree with Councillor Harmson that uh, I'm happy to see that um, we had come to something that, that we all could agree with. I I'd, would like to have been even more uh, because I, I, for one, believe that you folks are all the ones that, that hold the city together. You, 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 got, you have the boots on the ground doing the work that, that keeps this uh, city providing the services to our community. So you're, you're, you're invaluable or valuable. I don't know which, which, how you, which way that should be phrased, but uh, thank you for all that you do, and I hope this helps a bit. Yeah, thanks again for reaching out, and uh, this is a very happy vote for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm, I'm glad you come up when you felt like uh, this is need to be corrected. So to alarm the council and so we can know that uh, sometimes we don't know exactly like this is a contract that's closed. And I think so. Uh, when, when, he, when you guys create that contract, you never knew that gonna be COVID-19 and all this inflation will come up. I think like I'm glad that you come and you cut our attentions and uh, I'm glad the city manager figured it out and just like to, to, it, is, it is not easy to calculate all this and to be fair to everyone. And I think uh, as everyone said, you're doing a very important job. We sit here and just tell you what to do and you guys are the one who cutting that job, <laughs> which is uh, you are the front line. I really appreciate everything you do. I, without all city employees, I think this city cannot keep the way that 
it's cut right now. Thank you so much again. Just ever so briefly, some of, it's amazing how council can trigger certain um, things that you want to say. So I just wanted to say that, yes, this is a long overdue kind of heroes recognition because you did have to work during COVID and you were not covered under the heroes. And so um, I'm, I'm extremely glad that we could take ARPA dollars to actually acknowledge the work that you did. And um, again, as, as will come up, um, that, that we're able to listen in other ways too. I'm grateful for the collaboration um, throughout this process and thank you for um, yeah, the advocacy and letting us know what was needed. Well, I appreciate you all being here and I'm going to be excited to say yes, right? <laughs> 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 all right, we're going to go ahead and say roll call, please. Thomas. Yes. Alter. Yes. Burgess. Yes. Harmson. Yes. Salah. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Teague. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number nine C. No. Uh. Nine D <laughs> is fiscal year 2025 administrative confidential and executive pay plan resolution modifying classification compensation plans for administrative confidential and executive employees for fiscal year 2025. Can I get a motion to approve, please? Wolf Masale. Second, Burgess. All right. And we're going to go back to our city manager, Jeff. Yeah, real quick. Uh, so this one is uh, looking at fiscal year 25. So fiscal year 25 starts July 1 of next year. And uh, every um, uh, start of every fiscal year, the exact date differs based on payroll dates. But at the start of every fiscal year, uh, employees are provided an across the board up, up um, wage enhancement. That applies to everybody. Um, those are negotiated in collective bargaining agreements and historically your non-union employees, that is your admin, confidential and executive employees have received the same across the board update um, that uh, has been provided through the collective bargaining agreement uh, between the city and the AFSME group. So we have uh, two more items. Um, there are they are adjusting the, the wage um, and compensation plan for first the admin, confidential, and executive employees. That'll be your first vote. And then it's the same uh, terms for the AFSME employee group as well. And I'll walk you through this real quick. Um, this would increase uh, the planned across the board increase, <laughs> a lot of increases there, um, by 1.25%. So in the collective bargaining agreement as it stands today, uh, come next July 1st, uh, those two employee groups are slated to receive a 2.25% increase. This action will take that increase um, to 3.5. So it's a, it's, it's a uh, boosting it by 1.25%. Just like the bonus item that we talked about last time, uh, the way that the 3.5% uh, was um, um, determined was by comparing um, the settlement agreement that we have with the police union for next year. So next year, uh, again, July 1st of, of uh, 2024, um, the bargaining agreement between the city and the police union has 3.5%. Uh, we do not have a settlement with the fire union yet, so we're basing this adjustment uh, solely on the um, police collective bargaining agreement. So a lot of numbers thrown your way there. At the end of the day, you are increasing uh, the planned wage enhancement for staff by 1.25%. The first one, again, is your admin confidential executive. Then your next vote will be your AFSCME. Great. Any questions for Jeff? Anyone like to address this uh, item? OK, welcome. Hi, uh, my name's Grace Merritt. Uh, I work for the James Theater in Iowa City. Um, I'm also just a resident here. Um, I was, came earlier today to listen to the group of people that were advocating for a Palestinian ceasefire, um, but I also stayed to see what else was on the agenda. Um, something I think that was really 
uh, honestly weird that was said earlier was one of the people sitting in front of me uh, advocating for people that weren't in this room who felt like they might be targeted if they showed up to this room and talked against the housing reformation that was proposed um, from 27 to 35 feet. Um, at the specific use of like feeling like they might be targeted by their neighbors was really interesting to me. It was fairly off-putting to me, honestly. Um, and I think that it's important to note that like targeting is happening in this area and it is happening to people that are outspoken and it's noticed by the people on the board that their neighbors might treat them differently when they decide to be outspoken about things that are important to them. I do not find it to be a worthwhile use of city money to increase the money spent on wages for people that are able to violently target the members of our community. Um, I think there was a great example of this this past weekend um, when protesters were brutalized for speaking out against what they believed in. Um, I think if we're talking about targeting, we're talking about giving more incentive, we're talking about giving more tax dollars to a group of people that have an inequitable way to carry out whose voices are heard and whose aren't. Um, I think that we should really be taking a, a hard look at those kinds of things. Like it's, it's not um, a way I wanna see my tax dollars put to use. Um, I think if we're, if we're out loud willing to say that people are targeted for having opinions that are different than ours, we should look at who's able to enforce how you're targeted for those opinions. Protesters were picked up three weeks to four weeks after being at protests when no one at those protests said absolutely jack shit to them about being in a Respectfully, I need you to stay on this topic. Sure. I just think that it's relevant that those people that were brutalizing people that live in our community, I don't think they deserve more money. That's, I think that's the topic at hand. I don't think they deserve it. I don't think they've worked for it. I don't think this past weekend's actions are a great representation of that. And I think that we should keep that in mind when choosing to incentivize people who do target people in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion. Once again, um, thank you for bringing, uh, this is part of what we talked about before, bringing to our attention the uh, impact of the inflation and uh, uh, glad that we were able to increase this um, for both sets, uh, these comments apply to both sets, ACE and AFSCME, um, to write that imbalance uh, to some extent um, and also knowing that then the following year there will be some actual negotiations uh, with the union. So. So, um, you know, looking forward to hear some more of the voices at that point. So, again, thank you. Great. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Salah? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Um, I do see a hand raised, but I, it was after I closed the public hearing. Um, or the public comment. Um, 9E is fiscal year uh, 2025, ask me pay plan, resolution modifying article 21 of the agreement between the city of Iowa City and the Iowa City Library Board of Trustees and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Local 183, AFL, and CIO. Uh, could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, alter. Second, Taylor. All right, and um, any, I think Jeff gave his comments that really covered both uh, 9D and 9E. So we're gonna go direct to public comment. Welcome. Uh, hi, uh, nice to meet you. I'm David Sterling uh, in Iowa City. <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to briefly walk through uh, my journey of employment with the city uh, to kind of put this in a perspective. Uh, when I first started working for the city, it was a temp job at Parks and Recreation. A second job, I was working 45 hours a week. Uh, because of that, uh, the weekends that I was able to see my son, uh, I didn't actually see him until about 10 p.m., uh, uh, both Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, once I got onto the AFSCME contract and started working in the parking department, 
I was able to start seeing my son on Sundays. I still had to work Saturdays, but on the weekends he was here, I could see him at least one day. I chose my current position with the city in the revenue department uh, because it was a Monday through Friday job, which uh, meant that I would have full time on the weekends for my son. Uh, th this job has uh, drastically changed my quality of life with the pay that I've been given from it. Uh, but I would just like to put in a perspective that uh, working a Monday through Friday job uh, makes it very hard for me to find a second job. Uh, and the part-time wages that I earn uh, have allowed me to avoid um, uh, a number of emergencies that I would have gone through otherwise. Uh, however, I'm still struggling to afford some of the cheapest rent in town. Um, the, uh, the money that was uh, approved on the previous vote, the $1,000, uh, that is being prorated because I'm a 0.69 time employee. Um, I would just like to invite the counselors to consider that uh, while it seems like this vote is uh, uh, almost a done deal from everyone's attitudes, uh, I hope that going forward this helps start a broader discussion of what it is like to actually be an employee here, to desire to put more time into the city and uh, really just improve the quality of life for the people that we serve. Um, I've had a number of experiences in uh, prior departments where the amount of time I was allowed to work did not allow me to accomplish the goals that I had in the department to service customers. Um, so uh, this wage will be very, this wage increase will be very helpful to myself and a number of other employees at the city. Um, but uh, as we've acknowledged that this was a bad symbol moment, um, this is still at the end of the day, uh, less of a pay cut thanks to inflation. So I hope that uh, this isn't seen as just a, a one-time increase, but the start of a discussion on how to, over time, change what it means to work at the city, incentivize it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, um, my name is Penelope Wilmeth. I am a, I live in Iowa City and I'm a student at City High School. Um, and my mother, she is an AFSCME member and works at the ICPL. And I just wanted to say, I also volunteer at the ICPL occasionally. And just, you know, you can really see the passion and work that they put into their jobs and serving their community throughout COVID as well. Um, and so I guess just as a community member, I want to say that I support this and I think, you know, it really helps to to show our appreciation and in, in inflation to those who help our community. Thank you. Will you please put your name on that list oh, right yeah, there? Sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Anyone else like to address this topic? We're going to go online. Please state your name and city you're from. Hello, my name is um, Amalia Wild. Um, I am a citizen of Iowa City. Um, I also do work for the city. I work for the housing authority. Um, and I, first of all, just want to say thank you. I agree that it's really great that this is even on the table. It's really important. Um, I, as a worker for the city and definitely not one of the lower paid workers of the city. Um, I, the only way that I was able to afford to buy a home was to go through the city South district program. Um, and there's just a lot of other things in my life, you know, that it feels are out of my reach. And I think that I would like to agree with what David said, that I'd really like this to just be the start of the conversation um, so that the people who live and work in this city um, feel like they have the opportunities to enjoy being in it. Um, so I just want to thank you that this is here. Um, I just wanted to reaffirm that. Great. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online. Council discussion. Well, I just wanna say thanks again to all of the city workers. You all really are the boots on the ground and make living in Iowa City um, um, on so many levels a, a place where people that I've talked to, many are very happy. So uh, with the services that you all provide, so thanks to all of our city workers. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Sella? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. 
Motion passed to 7 to 0. 9F is Iowa City 2024 State Legislative Priorities. Resolution establishing the City of Iowa City 2024 State Legislative Priorities. And can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, Taylor. All right. And we're going to have Redmond Jones before us. Welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor Council. Uh, always a pleasure. So, um, as you know, we come uh, to this time of year uh, where we uh, look at our uh, legislative priorities. Um, the um, city council traditionally um, formalizes those uh, decisions through a resolution uh, that uh, I'll take a, a moment to go through. The city manager and myself met with our uh, state local delegation this morning, actually. And um, I, I will say that they are, are working hard for us, um, even though they're, they're fighting the headwind of, of partisan politics in, in Des Moines. Um, I think they are finding ways to still be effective and be uh, participating in the process. So I, I just wanted to say that I, I, think, I think we're in good hands uh, with the group of folks that we have out there. So um, just to give like a real quick overview. Uh, really, I know you guys are very familiar with them. Some of these are from previous years. We have a couple new ones uh, with our uh, new um, um, strategic plan. We kind of structured it a little bit differently uh, based on our values. So uh, I'll, I'll start off with our, our um, strategic plan value of climate action. Uh, under that, uh, we uh, continue to support uh, climate action initiatives, um, the city's climate action ad uh, adoption, uh, adaption plan, and, and um, continue to push uh, for the state to adopt the 2021 International um, Energy Conser uh, Conservation Code. Also, uh, in that same value, um, we support legislative changes that uh, um, would allow for investor-owner uh, utilities. This would allow citizens to buy into community solar projects that could then be used as credits toward their utility bills. We also, and, and continue uh, to uh, pray support from uh, our REAP grant with the Resource Enhancement Protection Grants. Uh, those are really critical for our parks, our natu uh, nat natural resources, and open spaces um, uh, initiatives. Also, um, and under our strategic plan value of advanced um, social justice, racial equity, and human rights, um, we continue, and this, is, this has been uh, an important issue as of late, particularly with um, um, Lake Ridge, um, and that is support legislation that protects the rights of our manufactured home residents. Um, this is really uh, important with rent protections, um, hoping to get a state, a state cap um, as well as um, longer notice um, periods um, to give residents uh, some ability to prepare for some of these changes that are coming in, in their rent. So I know that was uh, also uh, very um, important to much of our, our state delegation. We also took the opportunity to supply some of the citizen um, um, responses that we have gotten with our recent things. So they, they have gotten some of the written letters from <laughs> from um, um, residents there. Um, also, and we, we talk about the importance of ARPA, we're not, we're not out of the impact of COVID-19 and um, um, we continue to uh, support that uh, ARPA dollars uh, be used. And I, I know that the, uh, the governor herself mentioned to me that uh, she really liked the things that we were doing with the underestimated business um, grant program. I know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw it, yes she did. And, and part of it is, you know, make that comment, hold her hands to the, to the fire and say, yeah, you said this. Um, so the, I, I shared that with the delegation every chance you get. Um, hey, we, we would like to hear more about, because she had mentioned that there were some additional ARPA dollars that the state hadn't used yet, and our projects are getting real close to what we call shovel ready, and so we might be the perfect place to, to put that those dollars. So I want to keep those things going, even though, you know, it might be pie in the sky, but, you know, keep it ringing in the ear and, and talking 
into reality, right? So um, that's also important. Um, supporting um, uh, reform measures that reduce racial disparity and criminal justice system and address systemic racism. The governor had a, a focus committee on criminal justice reform and, and we promote those recommendations for an unbiased policing among other things. So we want to keep that um, also and in, in, in going. Uh, additionally, um, reinstate the voter approved library levies. So um, we, we had some conversation. Apparently, uh, the way it was stated this morning is that there's been, uh, at least from, from some um, key Republicans, that there's been some unintended consequences and that there's going to be some approach to retool, reclaim. We don't know exactly what that means, but we, we're, we're, we're ready and eager to support that and, and our delegation is ready to be a part of that, whatever that process looks like. Um, Going on, moving on, uh, protection and support of the freedom to movement for people using public and local trans, uh, transportation. This is all about safety. Um, one of the things that has always been a challenge is, is issues of, of safety and, and our bus drivers have been constantly talking about those type of issues. This is our, our approach to bring those, um, bring those issues, issues up. So obviously, you know, guns is, is a, a real, uh, maybe a sacred uh, child with maybe some in, in the legislative party, but uh, oh, in, 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 in the legislature right now, but we think there might be some ways to, to get in there and under the words of weapons and maybe knives. Uh, we've had some, some experiences with, with um, patrons on the bus utilizing knives and things of that nature. So there's some ways that maybe we might be able to address that, which was kind of reassuring because it also appeared to be one of those kind of pies in the skies with the uh, political headwind um, added, but there might be some ways to get in there. And so they're very eager to explore those uh, as well as our, our lobbyists. Um, so uh, going on, um, the next value is partnerships and engagement. Uh, I think one of the um, partnerships that we saw earlier in our work session with uh, USG and some of the challenges that they're having as far as uh, rent, um, renting and landlord relations, all that. Well, we, we continue to support um, um, the, the student government's proposal regarding um, rent uh, rental property check move-in checklist um, that had had some success in the House, um, got stalled in the Senate, never made it to the governor's desk. We think that there's still opportunity there, uh, so they're they're going to be um, working and seeking to see if that can get uh, moved the needle on that. Um, also, uh, support the continued ex um, excellence in our state's primary uh, and secondary and higher education institutions um, advocating for additional uh, funding, um, recognizing that uh, that's a key part of our economic um, growth, our standard of living, and um, future prosperity. Um, uh, as as well as initiatives, initiatives that uh, affect child care and and that so um, rounding it out this is something that we always kind of support is um, protect a uh, home rule authority um, and and also um, support the uh, organizations that uh, we've uh, worked through uh, the League of Cities and, and as well as the Metro Coalition. So um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to go into in deeper in any of those, but um, I just want to kind of give a quick overview. What was the, um, were you able to get any sense of the temperature as far as um, home rule? Like what were you hearing when you were up there? Is well, there any so it, 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 it depends on uh, how you define home rule, because everyone has a different view of it, right? Uh, I think if you look at from our standpoint, uh, we, we don't have a lot of it. And if you look from some, they was like, oh, you have home rule. But uh, when, when the kind of rubber meets the road with things like mass mandates and those things, you kind of realize that, nah, maybe not so much so. Uh, it, it constantly is, is a, a point of uh, contention that usually focuses around the issue. 
Uh, that, but that helps. We, we continue to push it when it shows when it shows up and we continue to say home rule because no one will come out and say you don't have home rule and we'll just try to pr find instances where we can say hey this could be adjusted better so we would literally have more home rule I think the property tax issue is, I is gonna, yes I'll follow up with yeah that though. absolutely no other questions thank you thank you great Anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, yeah, please come on up. Please state your name and city you're from. Hi, my name is Megan Vollenweider. I'm from Iowa City. Um, and these are just my personal opinions, but I'm really glad to hear that there's a little bit of movement on the library uh, funding because I love the public library. Uh, it's great that I go on a Beatles kick and I can just go over to the library and pick up a huge Tonkin book about it. Um, and it's totally free. Um, and uh, I also, the, I'm glad that the mobile home residents have become a topic of concern. Um, Iowa City's mobile home parks are a little bit out of the way, but they are there. Um, and they're a very important part of affordable housing in Iowa City, um, especially for large families. It's very hard to find affordable housing um, that will accommodate large families. Um, but yeah, I just am so glad that there's a little movement on that library funds. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Say no one in person or, oh, sorry. Welcome. Uh oh. I'm Rashonda Hannon. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I lived in Iowa City for 20 years now. Um, I'm just getting into the city council stuff with you guys, and I just wanted to speak about, like, uh, with the buses. Uh, I like how they changed everything up and they got us going and helping us out to move around. But um, I think that they were more stricter when I was younger because I see more teens just on the bus and it's like no enforcement, nobody saying anything. The bus drivers usually keep us tamed and everything. And now I'm seeing them just kind of let the kids go on and do quite a bit much. And with the police information, it's just like, I feel like we speak up when they say, see something, say something. Cause um, there was an incident that I've seen something that with someone new on the block and supposed to be schizophrenic and when the officer came I'm explaining to him there's no altercation never met the lady there's nothing going on but he's just kind of insisting that something happened what's going on where's their issue with me or with the child and to make something go on and I'm just like no there's totally nothing going on this lady just have a something that she's sick with and they can see and they're in their car, on the laptop or whatever, they see that she has a disability, but they don't know how far along it is. And I just felt like, you know, you're not hearing me. And I called. That was what I was supposed to do instead of making things get so crazy and out of order. But I don't know. Maybe I'm not really uh, sure about everything. I just kind of want to speak on it and get some information to get involved with something to make things a little better. And that's why I came in today. Thank Great. you. All right. Anyone else like to talk on the topic of Iowa City 2024 state legislative priorities? Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion. As I mentioned last time we talked about this, thank you to uh, staff for putting these together and, and uh, again, for, for really kind of working with myself and other council members on the stuff with the manufactured home. Um, you know, that's, that's a, one of my big priorities, and thank you for doing that, so. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, well, this is gonna be, as always, a, a legislative session that we're gonna all be watching, so. <clears throat> yes. All right, roll call, please. Harmson? Yes. Sela? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number nine G is grant agreement with Free Medical Clinic for facility renovations. Resolution authorizing the city manager to sign a grant agreement with the Iowa City Free Medical Clinic for facility renovations. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Alter. Second, Burgess. All right, and welcome Tracy Heisho again. 
Um, I'm happy to present. As many of you remember, this past year we took out a statement of interest for nonprofit capital grants for the community and how they can address the impacts of COVID. Two organizations were selected, Neighborhood Centers of Johnson County and Iowa City Free Medical Clinic. Um, Neighborhood Center of Johnson County is still working on their site acquisition. Free Medical Clinic has been working with their architect to refine the project so that we could come today and enter agreement for services. So Free Medical Clinic did a great job of explaining how they've been impacted by COVID and how the people that they serve, which are a lot of low income um, workers who probably don't have insurance or they're underinsured, they don't have probably time off for illness to go to appointments. They are seeing just at the beginning of fiscal year 24, they're seeing a 23% increase in services that than before the pre-pandemic. Um, they have a 12, wait, a three month wait list for medical services. So you go in today, it'll be three months before they can see you and a 12 month wait for dental care. So every day they are turning patients away. So the pandemic highlighted the existing health disparities uh, between the insured and the underinsured and it worsened the negative impact of access to timely and quality health care. Despite the free medical clinic running COVID vaccination clinics, many of their patients do not receive vaccines, and as a result, they're more likely to suffer from the residual effects of COVID. Also, they're seeing a spike in, in patients, but unfortunately, in May of 2023, they, a lot of patients lost their access to the expanded Medicaid coverage that was offered as part of the federal pandemic response. This provi project provides a million dollars to <coughs> renovate their facility to really expand the, the, the space that they have to provide care. So the million dollars will finally, they, and they've been applying for a long time. Jenny from Free Medical Clinic is here, so she can ask, answer questions too if I don't do an adequate job of explaining the whole project. Um, they'll, they'll do installation of ADA compliant elevator and staircase so that they can span that lower level. They'll do the HVAC improvements for the, both the main and the lower level. That will create necessary space to assist more patients. They'll create additional medical exam rooms, including a smaller triage room to schedule, uh, to utilize more volunteer practitioners during established clinic times. The, the additional office space in the lower level will allow them to hire and house a full-time staff dentist, a development director, a diabetic educator, diabetic educator and a social worker. The social worker will free up the registered nurse's time to, from negotiating patient's assistance programs and other services that patients need. It also includes a dental laboratory, which will allow them to expand their types of dental services, including the ability to make molds and dentures, as well as a multi-purpose room to host diabetic educational sessions, including cooking classes and other large group education, which can only be held in their waiting room during off-clinic hours. Um, and one of the many benefits of this project also includes increased capacity to store refrigerated medication. So right now they provide a one month supply. This allows them to supply, to supply a three month supply to accommodate the growing need for insulin by their population. And then lastly, the project includes the acquisition of furnishings, medical equipment, AV and telecom, telecom equipment to outfit the new spaces. And like I said, Jenny's here if you have any questions, but this will allow, we'll sign the agreement and this will allow them to proceed with the work. Mr. Mayor, sorry to interject. I didn't want to interrupt earlier. Um, uh, Council Member Salah has indicated to the city manager that she serves on the board of um, uh, the Free Medical Clinic and has thus recused herself. That's why she's not at the dais and will not be taking part in this item. Great, thank you. All right. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online, council discussion. Well, this is exciting. Yeah. Yes, we, uh, um, I think the council looked at um, many opportunities to kind of enhance um, different programs within the, within the community through the ARPA dollars. And thanks to uh, Mayor Pro Tem Alter and to uh, Councilor Burgess, who was also on this committee trying to uh, figure out, um, you know, how can we make an investment in this community. So happy to, that we're at this state right now and um, I think we're ready for roll call. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes seven is t six to zero. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Lord.
We are on to item number 10, which is uh, 10A. Uh, it's going to be council appointments. So we have. Um, oh, <laughs> yes. A lot. So I think I'm counting seven. Um, seven. Seven different commissions that we're going to be doing some appointments for. And how we're going to go about this is kind of go through each one um, and kind of uh, figure out who wants to recommend somebody for a commission. And then at the end, we'll kind of figure out who was all um, majority select. And we'll do kind of a one vote for all in the end. All right, so we'll start with 10A. And this is a board of adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term, January 1st, 2024 through December 31st, 2028. And we have a gender balance requirement, um, one female. And we only have one female. Yeah. yeah. But she's yeah. a good candidate. She, so. I was going to recommend she's her filling anyway. Filling out an unexpired term anyway, so. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yes. Paula's, Paula's great. Paula. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we we have that one. All right. We're going to move on to uh, Climate Action Commission. Uh, there um, there's three vacancies to fill a three year term, January 1st, 2024 through December 31st, 2026, and there is a gender balance requirement, three males. Um, ben. He was one on my list as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mark. Um, I also had, uh, I'm going to toss a couple of names out and then people can, we can go from there. But I was also interested, I thought Michael Anderson looked good. I thought Zach Harrelson looked good. Um, Robert Trayer. So those are names and people and um, candidates, applicants that others can respond to or. I also had Michael Anderson and Zach uh, Harrelson, mm -hmm. in addition to Benjamin Grimm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had Michael Zach Harrelson Anderson looked good as too. well. Yeah. <coughs> Pauline had Zach. Zach. What did you say, John? Michael Anderson is, um, I think, will be a good contributor. And I have Benjamin Grimm as well. You said Zach. Right, Ben, Benjamin Gran and Zach Harrelson. Yeah. Okay. And I said Ben and Mark. Yep. Mark or Mike? What? Uh, Mark Reagan is who uh, oh. Maz said. Uh, Michael Anderson was another up for me and for Laura. Yeah. Oh, okay. Three, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. three. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other recommendations? Um, so there's quite a few that <laughs> I can support one uh, Benjamin mm -hmm. and then uh, Michael Anderson. It seemed like there's quite a bit of support. So it seemed like we have four for those two. Um, anyone has any uh, strong feelings for anyone else? Who do we have uh, uh, in addition? We have Zach Harrelson, Mark Reagan, Reagan um, and then you had another. Oh, um, I had Robert Trayer. Mm -hmm. I only heard. But yeah, I did think the Robert Trayer thing. The uh, what was it? The um, taught environmental ethics. I thought that mm -hmm. was an interesting. <laughs> I mean, there. I agree. The, everybody I mean, that that's I, been named here I was sounds say, good. Before we, as we were going through, I was like, <laughs> and let it be known that this was an incredibly impressive pool of mm -hmm. interested and engaged people with really <laughs> impressive resumes. So, it seems like we have a 
We have two for Robert Treyer. Um, that's Sean and Megan. Um, Mark Reagan, um, I heard Ma's support. Um, and then Zach Harrelson, I heard Ma's and Pauline support. I also had Zach Harrelson. And he was in my list as well, so I mean, I had four people. So. All right, so we have, so Zach, we have four then at this point? I could, I could. Okay. All right, so we have Michael Anderson, Benjamin Grime, and Zach Harrelson for the Climate Action Commission. And then we're going to move on to item 10C is housing and community development. One vacancy to, file, to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through June 30th, 2025. So this is kind of a half term here. Mr. Mayor, I was wondering if this might be one. I know that we pushed this back from our last meeting, but then this month we had an odd meeting schedule, which may have, we, it, I think I would be okay with pushing this one back to our first meeting in January. Okay. Um, and, and giving this one a little more time. I agree. This one has one male. Requirement, yeah. And I don't know if anyone had conversations with people. Mm, I know. It was sort of mixed. I, I, I received a message from a candidate, and then I try, returned the call and okay. also did voicemail. So I'm in the process of kind of a little bit of jumping of phone tag. Okay. Um, what I will say is that I had a conversation with Clinton um, DeMambo, and that was a great conversation. So um, it, 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 he is also he also applied for the Human Rights Commission. And what was interesting during that conversation was he has a human rights certificate uh, from the Washington Institute of Diplomacy in Human Rights. And so his greater interest is in the Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. um, great conversation um, with him. And so I just wanted to make mention that. Thank you. That's great. But I, I, I just believe that we need to postpone it. The, uh, representation is really important, especially for this kind of commission. Mm -hmm. And that's why I guess will be referred to postpone it, <coughs> give people more time, advertise it. So we'll see. This is could be the last time we postponed it. Sure. Well, yeah, we don't see any more applicants. Right. Just I mean, will we see more applicants? It's, it's just the question. I mean, we already gave it an extra month. Did we, uh, publicizing it more, or uh, how can we get the word out, or start to encourage people that we know of that might be? good. I mean, not that these aren't good applicants, just as before, none of them really stood out. And, and I like your, uh, I was I was going to go ahead and say we should go ahead with, with uh, Clinton, but um, there's there's openings on the HRC, so uh, mm -hmm. if that's what he's uh, better suited for. Well, but I, I, you know, certainly I, I just brought up that the conversation that we had surrounded the human rights aspect of his, um, I guess, life. I, yeah, I think my concern with, with all of these, and hopefully we would get some applicants, uh, none of them really seem to have a great knowledge of, of what this HCDC is all about. So that's why none of them really jumped out. <laughs> yeah, maybe the exception of, of George. Um, oh, yeah, maybe. He, he does have, it looks like he has a little bit, uh, Kavarkis, if I'm pronouncing oh, that correctly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And he had so experience with grants and, and... If we were to move yeah. forward with this tonight, that would probably that would be, be who I'd throw mm -hmm. up, but I'd be okay waiting until January as well. Are... Um, If we were to wait, Kelly, I know that at some point we're waiting because we want additional applicants. So at some point, 
I know that if we had an open application and we couldn't find a mail, wait, it would have to be just a mail applicant, right? If there was no mail applicant, it wouldn't be if we felt that there was I think that's that's probably right. Well, we so we have yeah we have mail applicants at present. Yeah. So there's yeah. yeah so that rule You're of. You're talking about the gender. Yes. Appointment. Yeah. That's January first anyway. So if you deferred. Well, the it, second. It, usually in order to um, get to that point, you have to have not had any mail applicants. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. yeah. And you have some before you now. So I think oh. the gender yes. uh, requirement would remain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I think if there, if you know, one. I know we have a, a motion to defer. Um, I don't know if you want to put on George as an option. Uh, I think if if the council doesn't want to defer, I would do that. But that would be my second choice. But I'm not. Yeah. It's, it's not something I feel like I'm gonna be uh, you know upset about if the council wants to move forward. Yeah. Any other thoughts on appointment or deferral? I mean, I, I can support George, especially since, well, I mean, I can support George. If we need to wait, um, then there just has to be some <laughs> activation of, you know, ensuring people are aware of the opportunities. I think from last time, because we deferred it, it confused people, you know, because they, they, most of the people, they don't know that we have a meeting today. So that's why I say, like, that's why nobody applied to this one. And when is our, <laughs> I should know this, I have it on my calendar, our, the second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yes. we're entering into the holidays. I mean, we would have to blast this. I mean, if we could use our own networks to blast this out on social media or what have you to encourage people I can reach that's one thing but simply to put it out there again I don't think is going to get a lot of movement because it's the holidays and we're meeting right after the you know so I just put that up as a, another point of consideration how does it normally advertise for this you just put it on the website and that's it well, it goes in the, the paper the first time it's announced, um, but then it's on the city website, it's on the agendas. We send it to communications to put on social media. Um, and I don't know if the communications pushes it out to then like the different. You shared it with organization. You can go to organizations next door. Yeah. Those types yeah. Of things. I mean, we can give it one more, you know, if. if Sorry, when we had strategic planning and when we've had other things, Jeff has said, all right, well, if you want to flex your own, you know, reach out, just use our own political capital, use our own networks, then, you know, we can certainly try to do that and as well and see what happens. Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't mean oh, to ahead. step over you. Uh -huh. um, also, with the, also with the holiday thing in mind, is this commission meeting between now and January 2nd? I mean, I'm just saying it probably wouldn't make any difference. In no, terms no, I just mean in terms of response. Like right, is it right. is it worth holding it off? And again, we can call you know the individuals um, to learn more about you know their desire if because some of the applications weren't um, we didn't really have a lot of insight on their desire. So I think. If we're if we're going to hold off on this, let's make sure that we're making some calls um, to learn of the applicants, either new ones or the ones that are here, just to see sure. if they would be um, someone that we would recommend. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're gonna. Um, so I'm assuming. Um, <coughs> I heard. Um, I guess three say deferral. Four. I, all right, we got a fourth. We're going to move on <laughs> to um, <laughs> item. Same poll. We we'll gonna be there. We're going to we're going to move on to the Human Rights uh, Commission, which is 10D, and there are three vacancies to fill three-year terms, January 1st, 2024, through December 31st, 2026. There are some gender balance requirements. There is one male, one female, and one nun. 
I'd put Kelsey Paul Schantz mm -hmm. to be able to yeah. serve a full term. Yes. Um, and I, I want to put Liz, I a Latino background. Yeah. I agree with Liz, yeah. I also thought that uh, uh, Ann Kish, Kish, if I'm pronouncing that right, um, has got that the DEI background at the university um, uh, and, and uh, part of the African Community Network, which I thought were some, some good things to bring. Um, so that would be another name I would throw out there. I, uh, um, I think uh, I, would, I would, even though Rogers fulfilled a, Lusala has fulfilled one term, I would certainly, if others were in support of, of that, I think uh, Rogers did an amazing job, um, but has had a full term, and we, we often try and rotate people through if they have done a, a full term, so I'm okay either way, but just wanted to do a, do at least an, at very least an honorable mention. Um, yeah. Um, so that's my, my thoughts. I also agree with, with Kelsey. So, um, I'd like to bring forward the name DeAndre Steger. He's uh, younger. He's in the university and is involved in a lot of different activities, both throughout the university and in the community. And I thought that was an interesting um, potential addition to the Human Rights Commission, somebody who is younger and already very active. Um, I just I thought he had an interesting uh, resume, so to speak, a lot of engagement. Um, and I just like to see that there was somebody young who was involved. Um, I also, um, she has, uh, oh, it's one female one. Uh, well, there's one that's not, sorry, I'm processing out loud. I apologize okay. to those listening. Um, I'd also throw out there uh, Mika Covington as a potential. Um, she's very active, in, or not very active, uh, by her own um, resume, has been in, involved in um, doing a lot of advocacy work for rare diseases. In fact, I know um, she had contacted me, uh, I think, our first year on the council about getting a proclamation for it. So this is, you know, this mm -hmm. is, there's consistent um, engagement. I actually also uh, met her several years ago through sort of some political Same. circles and stuff. So I just, that's a possibility as well. Um, and she has had her name, she's shown interest in commission work for quite some time as well. So there's a persistent interest. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really good people is basically yeah. the problem, yeah. mm -hmm. a good problem, but. I think, so, yeah, as you said, this, there is many, many good people here. You know, it's really hard to pick. But for me, I always look to diverse, like diversity on the commission because the commission is, everyone will bring like unique representation from their own community. And by looking at the current like commissioner, we have African, we have, um, you know, the uh, white person, we have uh, Middle Eastern, we have, mm -hmm. and like, but this like adding a Latino person will be amazing. And uh, our community mostly is that are like, uh, especially when it comes to immigrants is like African who speak French and they have a unique cultures and Latinos and we have like all this. When we have commission look like the community, that's how we will really have good representation and they will come up with really good solution because everybody will have a voice at the table. That's why I'm saying Liz. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I can support Liz as well. I um, also had a great conversation with Liz. Her, um, what she submitted was phenomenal. Um, she is doing some DI work, I think contracted with the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, social worker, I think ma master's or PhD or something. Can't fully remember, but yeah, I can support Liz. I could also, I appreciated that yeah. she actually reached out and sent an email. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That shows true interest, I think. Sure. So, 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 it, so um, we have a majority for Kelsey and Liz. Kelsey is serving an unexpired term, which we typically, you know, have re-opt people um, if they didn't have a full term. Um, anyone else? 
think we need one male at this point. Is that correct? I Do I understand the gender balance? Roger and so DeAndre. Roger and DeAndre. DeAndre and DeAndre were my two males. Yeah. yeah. And I just... I mean, Roger has done such an amazing job, and he's such an amazing community member as well, and a great leader. I just feel like this is one of those commissions that there are so many applicants that this is the one it's highly prized yeah. and I kind of like the rotational aspect of it even though it pains me <laughs> is Roger right, so you have only one term mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. this is going to be like his second full term right, right. if he was reappointed mm -hmm. yeah right if we yeah. I think so I will support Roger as well I could go either or way with wait. Roger or DeAndre. Or was he in an unexpired term? Began nope, that he finished up the unexpired term. I, I, okay, but he served as chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would be okay with Roger. Mm -hmm. So I think I have a majority for Roger Lucella, Liz Shannon Mendez, and Kelsey Paul Shantz. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who is the fourth? Yeah, Sean. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's why you keep him up. <laughs> yes. All right, we're going to move on to Parks and Recs, which is 10E. Um, two vacancies to fill a four year term January 1st, 2024 through December 31st, 2027. Uh, there is a gender balance requirement one female and one none. And here we have lots of applicants as well. Some, um, we have one unexpired term, which is Alex Stanton. I was gonna mention that. Mm -hmm. I like that one. Yeah. Okay. So I'm here, I heard majority, yes. <laughs> so, okay. So then um, we would have to have, now I, yeah, Alex identifies as male, so we will have to have a female. I mean, there are some, some uh, again, we have an embarrassment of riches mm -hmm. with the quality of our candidates. Um, I would throw out there was one possibility, uh, Virginia Hayes, um, who's an arborist. Um, who I know a little bit because uh, uh, they have done some work um, in the, after the derecho, helping to remove the tree that we sadly lost from our front yard. Um, and just somebody I know a little bit who used to be actually, used to live over in University Heights and used to be a city council member over there. Um, Is she with so. Acorn by any chance? What's that? Does she have a, a does she work in a company doing tree work? Yes, and I was just thinking to myself, I can't remember the name of it. It's not Acorn? You know, I, I, I hate to venture a guess and get it wrong. Mm -hmm. I should know that, but not off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, I think her application says she's employed by Sustainable Landscape Solutions. And yeah, that could be. Yeah, and I think um, there was a few, but I, Virginia Hayes was good as well. I can support Virginia. Yeah, I can as well. Okay. Uh, I can do it also. So it sounds like we have majority. Okay. We are moving on to item number um, 10F is Public Art Advisory Committee. One vacancy, to, one vacancy for an art or design professional to fill a three-year term, January 1st, 2024, through December 31st, 2026. There is no gender balance requirement. <clears throat> I'll just throw Stephen Miller out there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good choice. I, guess was, you know, I, I have him in front of me. <laughs> well, the fact that he's yeah. encouraged by staff to reapply. <laughs> Doesn't hurt. All right, we got him. Yeah. We are going to move on to item 10G, which is the Senior Center Commission. One, vi one vacancy to fill a three-year term, January, 20 January 1st, 2024, through December 31st, 2026. So there is a gender uh, balance requirement. One female 
It was re-advertised. And we... One applicant. Yeah. So. She's a female, and she's been a member of the center for 16 years, so yeah. she should know what it's all about. Or, or did you want to say something? I was just going to say we would have to, if you appoint the one applicant we have, we would just have to re-advertise the other one. Mm -hmm. So there are two, two There are two vacancies, gotcha. yeah. Yep. Okay. So I could support Nancy. Mm -hmm. Yes, as well. Yeah. And then we'll have to re-advertise. Re, re All right, I think we have done it. <laughs> so, I kind of lost my... <laughs> Mind? <laughs> yeah, well, wasn't fully writing. Mayor, I, can, I think I've got, I think I've oh. got it, Mayor. Uh, or did you have it? Okay. Uh, let me see, we have Paula Swigert for Board of Appeals. Adjustment. Or, sorry, adjustment. Um, Benjamin Grimm, Michael Anderson, and Zach Harrelson for climate action. Mm -hmm. We are going to defer HCDC, so don't have to, to do anything with that. To January 2nd. Mm -hmm. um, HRC is Kelsey Paul Schantz. Um, Liz, I have her last name. Liz. Mendez. Uh, Mendez Shannon. Mendez Shannon and Roger Lusala. Right. Uh, Parks and Rec are Virginia Hayes and Alex Stanton. Correct. Public Art is Stephen Miller. Senior Center is Nancy Ostrogani. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not. I can't do it. Um, and then re advertise. All right. Well done. Position. So who's going to move? So moved, Mayor. So moved by Sean. Second. Um, so uh, moved by uh, Harmson, seconded by Salah. Um, all in favor, in, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. We are on to, well, thanks for that. <laughs> and and Mayor, I just want to say something, because now, like, for example, we say we defer to the second of next meeting. Uh, the second of January for next meeting, you know, always like people understand will be okay. I can I can maybe fill out the application until the first. I think we need just to say something about the deadline, mm. so that people know about it. Mm -hmm. That was confusing for the last one here because it was until the fifth, I think, of the. I think the city clerk is looking it up, maybe. Yeah. I mean, technically, it's open till filled. Yeah, that's what um, that's what I was. Asking you last time, technically, because we say open until fill, then can the people just like do the application until anytime, anytime until the last minute? They, yeah, I mean, 24 we, we, hour, would, I mean. we would put what we have in the packet, but then we could do late additions if people okay, mm -hmm. yes, just yes, making sure from that, yeah, yeah. we'd want to so encourage good. early applicants, right? Of yes. course, yeah. yeah, of course, especially yeah. with the day before being a holiday. <laughs> Right. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Oh. No, I think uh, a good really point of clarification. So, uh, yeah. Business day. So it would be any the late handouts would be the 29th. 29th. Okay. Yes. I think that's Thank fair you. enough. Good reminder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. We're on to items number 11, announcements of vacancies previous. 11A is going to be airport zoning board of adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Airport Zoning Commission, one vacancy to fill a six-year term. Board of Appeals, one vacancy for an HVAC or building design professional or a qualified trade representative with experience and training to fill a five-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, East College Street, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Woodlawn Avenue, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Public Art Advi Advisory Committee, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. 11B is announcements of vacancies new. Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment ending December 31st, 2024. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, January 30th, 2024. 
And then we're on to item number 12, which is city council information. And I know that this is our kind of our last hurrah for two of our counselors. I know John has some words to say. Do you want to start, John, right, or I'll, do you want me to go ahead? I don't care. Start, but it's been a long, long day here. I'm <laughs> going to have to kind of wish I had a cappuccino or something to get me going. But anyway, I, you know, this has um, been a moment or time for me to kind of look back and look you pull forward. pull that closer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> to look back and to look forward uh, and, and look for a narrative if there was one. I'm certainly become increasingly interested with the telling of stories and how important they are in engaging um, with others and, and conveying meaning. And so I have some parting thoughts um, along those lines. Uh, the title of, of this story is at work building community in a time of political polarization, ecological overshoot, climate change, and other dis many other disruptions. So it's, it's a difficult time uh, to be working in building community. I'm a generalist by training and sensibility seeking to understand the relations between things. As a counselor, I have a strong interest in a wide range of issues, the city's financial stability, the urban forest, taming automobiles, new urbanism's form-based code, missing middle and affordable housing, economic and racial justice, and the use of ecological principles as a measure of the just and sustainable city. But my most enduring passion and the connective theme of my life is building community <clears throat> with an emphasis on strengthening neighborhoods especially their public realm as a foundational element toward that purpose. As a landscape architect employed for 23 years in San Francisco's Public Works Department, my colleagues and I designed landscapes in the public realm, such as parks, libraries, recreation centers, and streetscapes. Much of that work took place in San Francisco's diverse neighborhoods and districts, such as Chinatown and the Mission, Marina, and Richmond districts, all within a 49 square mile peninsula, about twice the size of Iowa City. So it seemed almost ordained that soon after arriving in Iowa City in November of 2009, my work would center on efforts to build community. Initially, the projects were in my own North Side neighborhood, eventually expanding to encompass the greater Iowa City area. In my professional experience, the planning process for a public works project deeply engaged those people whose lives would be affected by the outcome. As the great neighborhood activist and writer Jane Jacobs noted, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. The complexity of public works cannot be realized without engaging the public's diverse perspectives in a series of deliberative face-to-face -face public conversations. Since, since coming to Iowa City, I've had the extraordinary opportunity to work with Northside neighbors and city staff on the renovation of North Market Square Park, originally built in 1839, and Horace Mann Elementary School, originally built in 1917. Together, they form an outstanding model of regenerative urban design, creating a strong multi-use civic center for the Northside Goosetown neighborhoods and a great elementary school for the Iowa City Community School District. I am reminded of Winston Churchill's quote, we, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. I have come to deeply value the importance of the public realm in our everyday common life, which can offer experiences of profound beauty as well as a sense of connection to the people and things immediately around us. Since serving on the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council, my approach to building community shifted from the design of public spaces to crafting public policy in a broader sense. From that perspective, a critical question regarding the health of Iowa City is whether the built environment provides the opportunity for community to manifest itself in a time when glass screens, our phones, our computers, our motor vehicle windshields separate ourselves from each other and our surroundings. The neighborhood is an essential element of the built environment that can foster community. 
In a world saturated by technology, why is it so important? For most of our human existence, we lived in small groups, often no larger than the small towns of Iowa, many of which are beautiful, resilient archetypes of town planning. Industrial civilization, however, has dramatically increased the size and population of human settlements. Even so, the most successful cities typically consist of smaller, human-scale neighborhoods and districts, districts, each with their own identity. What are some of the qualities that a neighborhood or district should have to thrive and reach its full potential? Some of these interrelated everyday qualities are found in our strategic plan, and they include having a name, having at least one place that serves as its center, having social diversity within it or being open to its enabling, having everyday facilities and services, though not being self-contained, having a means of representation by which residents can, can be involved in its affairs and, and an ability to speak with a collective voice, and having multimodal internal and external connectivity that is safe and comfortable for all. These everyday qualities go beyond the provision of a strong public realm. However, the elements that make up the public realm, the streets, the sidewalks, parks, schools, and open spaces provide the settings <clears throat> in which networks of social capital can form to help and advance land use policies addressing mixed land use and social diversity. So looking ahead, neighborhoods can serve can and should serve as an important role in ad further advancing the manifestation of community in Iowa City. They can provide a foundation upon which citizens engage in Iowa City's more general affairs. Indeed, the Northside neighborhood provided me with such a bottom-up foundation as the Northside neighborhood coordinator, where I, first, where I was first introduced to the democratic exercise of neighborhood organizing, our comprehensive plan and zoning code, in Iowa City's governance and structure and the confines of City Hall. The City, Hall, the city, of, the city of Iowa City can help inspire regenerative efforts in our existing neighborhoods to better flourish and ensure that new neighborhoods are planned to incorporate the qualities necessary to encourage social cohesion, diversity, and de democratic self-governance. So there's much work <coughs> to be done building community in this time we are living in. Thank you, Iowa City, <clears throat> for the opportunity of, of, to serve as your city, your city councilor for the last eight years. I shall be forever grateful. So thank you all. Thank you, John. It's going to be hard to uh, follow your well thought out words. I, uh, mine, mine's just going while. to sound rambly. It's just random thoughts I put down on paper. And, um, but first of all, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you, Kelly, and, and whoever helped you to set up the reception. It, 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 it oh, yes, <laughs> Ashley, very good, because it, it was wonderful. It was a uh, very emotional experience. It was, it was so great to, to hear well wishes from folks and, and, uh, see the friendly faces and their warm wishes and, and, and their hugs. It, it just really made the last eight years feel really worthwhile that uh, it was a great, pe great group of people to work with and great citizens in the community. And so thank you. It was, it was a very nice, very nice reception. Uh, now I'll start on my rambling words here. I, um, counting the years that I, I spent studying at the University of Iowa, I've been in Iowa City for over 50 years, and that just seems like such a really long time, but I love Iowa City, and I'm very proud to call it my home. Um, there's a story that I enjoy telling about an experience that I recently had while in downtown Iowa City. I think Jeff may have shared this with you, but, but it bears repeating, and I told some of the folks at the receptionist, the downtown folks and others, that. Um, Recently, I, an out-of-town friend uh, joined me for a concert at the Englert, and afterwards we walked around downtown 
uh, to decide on a place to eat. Uh, my friend was amazed, truly amazed, at our downtown area. And she grew up with me in Des Moines, and we had a downtown, but it's nothing like, it's nothing like this downtown. Uh, now she lives in Woodward, a small town. But she just kept saying over and over again, all of this is the downtown, all of this. And, and of course, I proudly told her that, yes, it is, because uh, we went on Washington Street and Clinton Street and Dubuque Street. We just we did the whole round, so she was very impressed. And then when we were heading to our cars, we came across the musical group that uh, we had just seen perform at the Englert, which we were like, wow, you know, like the groupies here, because they were uh, uh, Get the Lead Out, a Leonard Skinner tribute band, which was amazing, <laughs> from our good songs from our 60s. So we were still high on that, and then to actually see them and talk to them. Uh, but they were, they were gathered outside their tour bus, and we stopped to talk to them, because, of course, I had to tell them that I was from, I lived in Iowa City, and they immediately told me how much they all loved Iowa City. They absolutely loved loved their time in Iowa City and that they'd be sure to come back, which I'm sure they will. Um, but then they also told me that what they re were really were impressed with, what they really impressed them, was how clean our alleys are. <laughs> and I, you know, I thought about it later. I thought, well, they've probably been in some cities, these large cities, and they go out for a smoke and have these stinky, dirty, garbage-filled alleys. But um, it just made me very proud of the efforts the city has made with the downtown district to help clean up the alleys. Um, so to the new city council members and the returning members, never doubt that um, any and all of the decisions and votes uh, that you make will have a lasting effect on our community because it really does and it comes back to you every now and then and because uh, I'd kind of totally forgotten about the alley thing until they brought that up um, but we did spend quite a bit of time on that and downtown has too and uh, with now the murals and the cleanliness it's it's amazing um, and serving on the city council for the past eight years has been an incredible experience for me. It was not only a pleasure, but I saw it as a commitment to serve the community that I've loved for over 50 years. Throughout those eight years, I might not have always agreed with my fellow council members on everything, but I've always shown them and treated them with my utmost respect. The ethics, morals, and values that I have followed throughout my lifetime serve to guide me in making decisions. My life experiences, passion, and dedication to help people also carried over uh, to my work on, on the council. The past eight years hold a lot of memories, many of them very positive. Of course, there were also some stressful moments, uh, but a lot of us went through that together. We, we made it through them uh, as a council and as a city. I would like to express my gratitude first and foremost to my family for their continued support during my tenure on the council. We've been through some rough times, but we're going to get through it and I'm going to spend more time with them. And to the many people that I might not have ever met except for being on the council, many of whom were in the room tonight, it's been a pleasure to meet each and every one of them and to get to know their thoughts and feelings about Iowa City. I would like to thank, as I did, uh, each and every member of the city staff who literally do keep our city functioning, as I said in the pay plan discussion earlier. Thank you also to, I see a couple still here, to the department heads who have been very helpful over the years in answering questions and providing the council with very thorough reports. <laughs> have to give special thanks because they recently helped me yet again to the IT department <laughs> uh, who have been very helpful to me whenever I've had technical difficulties. They just helped me change my password again. Uh, they're always very professional, very kind, and uh, get things done very quickly, so I, I do appreciate that. I would all, I, here, here I come, Tracy. <laughs> I would like to especially acknowledge Tracy Heitschu. She and I served on the nationwide Invest Health uh, project. Iowa City was one of only 50 cities selected across the country uh, to participate. And it was a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, we all learned a lot from it. Um, so thank you, Tracy, for being such a great person to travel with. And I had to verify with her because it seemed like she and I, uh, while we were out visiting these different cities really appreciated Iowa City and, and what we've accomplished. Uh, we, we, we're really far ahead of many cities. Do I say it, Tracy, especially Des Moines? <laughs> Sorry, Des Moines. But, <laughs> but we really felt that, that, you know, gosh, the things that we've been doing over the last five, ten years, we've made a lot of accomplishments that some cities are still struggling with trying to figure out a way to do it. Um, 
so thank you again for being being a great person to travel with and, and inviting me to join you on that. Uh, and I, I hope that you can continue utilizing the great information, and it sounds like you plan to, that we learned when visiting the various cities across the country, because uh, I'm very proud of your Healthy Homes Project uh, and the South District Home Ownership Project, so, so keep up the good work. Recently, I came across a quote from Fred Rogers, yes, alias Mr. Rogers, um, who's a wealth of information and, and wisdom, and I feel it's very appropriate at this time. He said, and I quote, often when you think you're at the end of something, you're at the beginning of something else, end quote. So I will leave you with that thought and wish all of you uh, happy holidays for whatever holiday um, you observe and uh, say thank you very all very much and uh, goodbye. <laughs> yes. Any other comments by council? Thank you. Yes. yes thank, thank you both. Thank you very much. I did want to, of course, thank you all. Really appreciate all you've done. I did want to um, just mention that we did lose a great humanitarian um, within our community, Pastor or Reverend. Bob Welsh, uh, who had passed away. I mentioned him earlier today. Um, uh, he was just a phenomenal guy, great humanitarian. Um, his work, how I got to know him, was advocating for elderly people. Uh, that was his one of his passions. And so just wanted to acknowledge um, his passing. There will be a service held on January 6, 2024. Um, at 1 p.m. at the First Christian Church. So just wanted to acknowledge um, that he did pass away. We're going to move on to item number 13, reports on items from city staff. Or we'll start with our city manager's office. Well, to Councillor Thomas and Taylor, I, I want to say thank you um, on really behalf of all the staff for your, your service. Um, it's, it's hard for me to even think back eight years and think of all the things that you've helped shape. Um, we've gone through major infrastructure projects, park projects. We've uh, revamped uh, significant policies like our tax increment financing policy, our affordable housing policies. Uh, we just launched free fare bus service. Uh, it's truly amazing the, the impact that you've had. and as you said, we'll continue to, to move on. So, so thank you for that service. And then uh, selfishly, uh, thank you for supporting me in my role here. Uh, you were the, the last two counselors standing who uh, gave me the opportunity to, to step up and serve as city manager. And I'll be forever grateful for your uh, support at that time and your support for the, uh, the eight years that uh, I've been able to serve with you. So thank you. I was waiting for you to call on me, Mayor. Sorry. All right. Yes. Yeah, so we'll go to the city attorney's office. <laughs> well, I'll join Jeff's comments in thanks to both uh, Paula and John for all your service, uh, lengthy service to the city. I know that being a city council member is often not a lot of fun. Uh, people think it's, you know, uh, a glorious position, but I know how many calls you get and that your ear is bent in the community, no matter what you're doing, and that you need to gather information from everyone you speak with in your, uh, in as part of your constituents and then come to a you know, reasoned and uh, intelligent decision. And I think you both have done that in spades, both in your time. And like Jeff, I will also thank you both for being part of the council who hired me uh, a couple of uh, years ago. I appreciate that as well. And I wish you uh, luck and good fortune in whatever, you, whatever you're starting that's next. We're gonna go over to the city clerk's office. They always steal my thunder. Um, I'm going to say ditto and thank you for your service. And it really has been great working with, with both of you. And, and you both hired me, too. So <laughs> uh, I wish you the best. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to still see a lot of you at the meetings. So thank you. Great. Thank you. 
All right. Well, we are at item number 14. Can I get a motion to adjourn and wonder if I can have a move by? Oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want it to end. So I'll move. So I'll move. Move by Taylor. Second that motion. Seconded by Thomas. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned.